Welcome my friends, my name is Irvin, also known as Kobo Man. In today's video, we're going to look a real-world scenario in which you may come across in tech support. In this situation, we cannot access a remote computer so we can make changes to it or fix something on it. So what happens is, we, for example, try to backdoor into it to make some changes. We would simply, you know, for example, type in uh, backslash backslash name of the computer that we're trying to access. And then we would try to hit enter and the error would be, well, you don't have administrator privileges, so you can't do anything with that. Or we are trying to remote desktop into it and it would be the same thing. We would type in the name of the computer, hit enter, and it would say, well, you don't have administrator privileges, you can't access. So what seems to be the problem? Well, here's the thing. As tech support, you probably belong to a group, group. Uh, policy on the domain that has administrator privileges that's automatically applied to all the computers that belong to that domain. So in this case, what happened was is the chances are that that group policy hasn't applied to that computer locally. So let's say the name of your group on the domain, let's just open sticky notes real quick so we can have a reference. Let's say the name of your group is IT support. You and everybody else that belongs to that group, you and everybody that belongs to this IT support group on that domain has admin access. So at this point, in order to quickly resolve this issue, instead of going through, you know, reimaging the computer, this and that, or trying to force any of these things, we can just simply add IT support group that you belong to with administrator privileges. We can add it to this computer at local level. And if you appreciate this type of content, instead of me playing an advertisement here, please take a second here and just click the like button or subscribe to my channel. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And this way I don't have to bug you with ads. So how do we do that? Well, first of all, we need to have a local administrator password or our local administrator login so we can make these changes locally. Obviously, uh, we need local admin uh, privileges. So what we're going to do is going to access our system with using local administrator. Now, this is one of those things that your company will provide for you. Uh, you know, if you have a good company that you work for, chances are that every computer that they have will have a backup login, which will be a local admin, local admin and will have a specific password for it. So you're going to have to find this out. You're going to have to look up the name of the computer that you're trying to troubleshoot. For example, you can see here that the name of this computer is called tech support. So you would access the database that has the passwords for the tech support, um, for, for the local admins on tech support, and then you're going to find that what that password is and what the login name for that is, and then you would log into that computer. In my case, I am logged in as administrator using this login. So in my case, it's YT login and it has administrator privileges and it's for this computer that's called tech support and I am good to go. Now I can make changes to the group policy that uh, has applied to this computer. All right, so let's get to it. Now, in order to do this, we're going to have to open up our local group policy. Now, this is the wrong thing to look at. A lot of people look this up and they're like, oh, well, how do I do this? Where is this at? This is the wrong thing. This is local group policy editor for the components of the window or anything that runs on this computer. So what this basically does, you would go in and, for example, allow or disallow a component of the windows or software to run. For example, it would say allow, you know, or, you know, or deny um, whatever is trying to do. Okay. And this is not it. What we want is actually called local users and groups. So in order to get that, we can type in lusrmgr.msc in our run command and we hit OK and it's going to open up our local users and groups. Here's where we're going to apply our changes so that we can go about our business and get to fixing this computer. Now, there are roundabout ways to get this and you can get to this through the computer management as well. If you go to control panel, click administrative tools and then select computer management, you can see that Local users and groups are here as well, which is the same thing as the window that we opened previously. 
like so. So it's the exact same thing. You can see users and groups here. It's the exact same thing as what we have on this other side. So that's one way to go about it. Now, you can apply this um, IT support group by selecting groups here in this in this left hand side so make sure you select groups not users users are just local accounts groups is what we want so we're applying a group policy to this computer and let me just expand this here so it's easier to see a little bit easier to understand because i really want to highlight the part that we're going to make changes to all right so what we're going to do is add administrators group policy to it. So obviously we're going to select administrators. And you can see here, if you read it, it says administrators have complete and unrestricted access to computer slash domain. Get it. So IT support group belongs to a domain. Now we're going to add IT support to the administrators of this computer that is locally. And we're going to now do that and once we do that all the administrators all the people that belong to this IT support group will have administrator privileges on this PC at that time so the way you do that is simply select add and we're going to type in IT support and then we're going to click OK and in this case it's not doing anything because it's not it's just a fictional uh, you know uh, group policy so what happened is we would add it and then suddenly you would see IT support a domain group policy applied to this and you would simply click OK and possibly reboot the computer but it should take uh, effect immediately at this point the whole point of doing this is so that not only will you have administrative privileges on this computer now you can make any changes to it you want remotely or this and that but everybody else that belongs to that group, so all the people that work with you, now they don't have to go through this thing of getting local administrator login, the password, this and that. Now you can make all these changes and then everybody can just log in and that's the quickest way of doing, uh, doing this. Now, of course, if the local group, if the group policy hasn't been applied to this computer automatically for some reason, then there may be some other issue that you may want to look at it. However, this is a quick fix and you can just go about your business and then you know anything else I mean there might be multiple groups that need to be applied to this it just depends in, depending on the on the system uh, of the business setup that you have where you work at it's just going to kind of vary uh, you know from business to business anyways um, if you like this type of information please don't forget to like subscribe leave any comments and I appreciate your support thank you so much and you have a good day bye bye Hello my friends, my name is Irvin, also known as Kobo Man. In this video I am talking about Microsoft's remote desktop feature uh, that is within all versions of Windows except 3.1 and earlier as far as I know. But XP, Windows 7 and Windows 10 will have a remote desktop. So the way you find it is just simply by searching for remote desktop you can just type that in in your search box so either way once you find it you can look it up and see that you know this is remote desktop and if you work in tech support you already are familiar with it but then again you're also familiar with some issues that are related to a remote desktop and one of them is configuration and the other one is usability so if you have a remote desktop like this this is the default and if you you know, if you want to access another computer, you would simply type in the name of the computer or the IP address and you can remote desktop into it. And for the most part, that is fine, given that the remote computer is allowing remote desktop sessions. So how do we look at that? How do we find whether a computer is even enabled or allowing remote desktop session? Because here's what happens. If I just type in the name of a computer that's on the same network so let's say computer one and we know that's the host name for that computer we're trying to connect to it and we simply select connect and it will try to do it it would try to do it and it would give me this you know error says you cannot do it well that doesn't mean that the computer is not on the network or even part of the same domain which it should be in order for the remote desktop to work properly um, 
I should say on the same network, it doesn't have to be on the same domain. But another reason could be is the fact that the remote desktop is disabled. So in order to check that, we would have to go to that computer and then go, then go to computer properties like so. so. And then from here, we would select remote settings on the left hand side. Once this comes up, we can see whether it's enabled or not. And the remote desktop is right down here. Not to be confused with remote assistance, that's something else. So if this is disabled like so, then your computer is not reachable via, via remote desktop, right? So we have to make sure that this is enabled and uh, that would do it. Um, I do like that a pop-up just came up that kind of reminded me that another reason you wouldn't be able to reach a computer one in our case or its IP address via, via remote desktop is that it might be asleep. So what I found is that as long as wake up uh, function is enabled on the computer at the BIOS settings, wake up on LAN, it will allow for that computer to wake up and then you'll be able to remote desktop into it. Because otherwise it will be just like this. You're trying to remote to it, everything's set up correctly and you still get this. And it wouldn't happen as fast usually because it would try to wake it up. And then if you just give it a few seconds actually, if you give it a few seconds and try it again, it's going to actually connect because you woken up the computer by simply pinging it with the remote desktop connection. So that's something to keep in mind. It's kind of uh, uh, kind of useful. It'll save you time instead of trying to figure out what is wrong with it, and uh, or just assuming that you can't reach it, or you know this and that. Um, you just kind of keep in mind that you can wake it up with the remote desktop. It just happens automatically. You just kind of have to give it a few seconds for it to happen. So aside from going to BIOS, one way to tell whether a computer is enabled for wake up on LAN is to go to computer properties and we're going to go to our device manager and then we're going to go to network adapters. And then we're going to find our network adapter. In my case, it's Intel Ethernet connection. We're going to go to properties and then we're going to look for an option that says power management. Inside of that, we can see whether it's enabled or not. You can see it says here, allow this device to wake the computer. So that's how you tell whether it's enabled or not. And again, this can be checked in BIOS as well. Another reason is that if the computer is shut down, you cannot turn it on. Um, that's another reason why you wouldn't be able to reach a remote computer. It's not turned on. So it's not, you cannot turn it on because the remote desktop f from Microsoft does not have that function. One thing to keep in mind is that through command line, you can actually do some functions that could help you when it comes to remote desktop sessions. And there are only a couple of things that I'm aware of that you can do. And that is to either shut down or restart to computer. So in our case, shutting down the computer is not useful because we won't be able to wake it up unless we have some other means, but we can restart a computer. So let's say a user has remained logged on to the computer, to the remote computer. What will happen is that whenever you initiate, you know, connection, remote desktop connection, it would say, you know, somebody else is logged on and you may not be able to log them off, you know, but you can tell there, you know, that they're not here. You know, it's three in the morning. They're not here. I need to have access to that computer. So what you can do is restart the computer. So if you go to command line and just type in shut down, this will actually bring a bunch of options that gives you ability to initiate remote desktop uh, restart. And that will kick off this remote desktop user. It would, it would force him. You can do a, a command line as part of the setup that you have to force the remote desktop to restart. So if you go to this section of the CMD, you can see some commands. And of course, if you do some 
basic research on the internet you can come up with your own version of remote desktop restart where you can force it and it would kick off the person that is using the remote computer and that way once it restarts you can log on to that computer and make changes of course use this at your own discretion because if they remain logged in and they have some unsaved work on that computer then you may not want to restart it or force it to restart because they will lose that data so use that at your own discretion but if your computer systems or computers at your work are scheduled to restart at night and users are aware of that then there might not be any repercussions of you actually restarting the computer 3M because that's what happens anyways. Another issue with remote desktop is that, yes, you can save your own credentials. If you, if you expand the options, you can save credentials here so you don't have to type them in each time. But this is only good for you and for your domain login. This is not going to be useful other than that because you cannot use a remote desktop while somebody else is logged on to that computer you either are using the remote desktop or using that remote computer yourself or the user is using whoever is sitting at that computer or using that computer so that's a huge huge problem with that so you can't just you know remote desktop initiate remote desktop connection and just take over the existing session that is already in progress with the user. So user will not you know, be able to show you remotely what is going on, while other remote desktop software will allow you to do so. So that's a one huge problem when it comes to remote desktop connection. Of course, I am definitely grateful that it does exist because I still use it at work and um, especially if I'm trying to configure multiple computers or uh, access multiple computers at once without uh, you know, letting anybody else know what I'm doing on that computer and the computers are available and not being used by the group that is sitting there. So for example, let's say you work you know, after hours. If you work after hours, remote desktop, connection would be just fine for you because chances are nobody else works at that company at you know 2 a.m 3 a.m or whatnot because typical hours are you know eight to five depending on the type of business so if yeah if nobody's using the computer yeah you can certainly do so log in remotely connect to that computer and configure things programs and etc and etc the last thing I wanted to talk about when it comes to remote desktop is related to audio. In order to troubleshoot audio on the remote computer, so let's say there is a headset or speakers connected to the remote computer, you won't be able to troubleshoot it unless you make some changes to the remote desktop session uh, configuration before you actually connect to that remote computer. So what you have to do is go to show options, go to local resources, and then select settings under remote audio select settings and then make sure that you have play on remote computer selected and then select okay otherwise you won't be able to actually see components within windows that are related directly to the sound controller otherwise you would just say remote audio so let's let's close this out here open our sound settings by the way this is a remote desktop that i'm connected to right now if you look at the playback settings here it normally shows you know real tech this is the typical what you will see on when it comes to audio controller on a computer and if you go here you can see that i don't have uh, i don't have a microphone connected to that remote computer so this is everything remote but if you haven't done uh, or changed those settings that i just showed you which again let me show you here real quick options local resources settings if you do not select that play on remote computer and save that it would just say remote audio here and if you go to recordings it would be blank so what you're doing is actually just making changes or have the ability to make changes to your own computer not the remote computer 
However, if you change it to play on remote computer, you'll be able to actually see the sound card on the remote computer as well. So when it comes to remote desktop, it's very limited. I Again, I am glad that it does exist. It is useful. I'm not going to say it's not useful because it is, but it is very limited and compared to a lot of other software, remote desktop software available out there, it is very lacking, very lacking. So I would recommend using it if you have nothing else, but once you start using some other remote desktop software, you will realize how awesome it is when you can actually take control over user sessions in real time and they can show you what their problem is in real time as if you were there and many, many other things that are done a lot better compared to Microsoft's remote desktop. I hope you guys like this video. Please do share it with friends or family. And if you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer them. I am here for that purpose to help you out no matter where you are in the world. Thank you so much. Have a good day. Hello, my friends. My name is Irvin, also known as Kuboman. Today's video is about Linux, introduction to Linux, navigation specifically, and the comparison to Windows and how similar they are. The purpose of this is to help you transition from Windows to Linux, not in a permanent sense, but to help you actually decide to learn a little bit of Linux because Linux is just awesome and you won't believe oh, how similar it is to Windows with the exception of some commands. But when it comes to its structure, it's incredibly similar. So starting off, I just want to show you that this is a virtual machine of the Bayan uh, distro that I'm using. And uh, we are at what, what they also call what's called console or a command line for Linux. In comparison, we have a command prompt, also known as DOS for Windows. So the default starting position for Linux is exactly the same as for Windows. So in order to prove it to you that I am in the exact same location as Windows, is uh, very simple. I have to list all of the directories that are within this current directory. In order to do that, we're going to type in ls, which basically lists all of the content that are within a directory, whether it's a current one or the one you specify. In our case, we're just going to list the content of the current one. So if I type in ls, we see some familiar stuff. What does that look like? That looks just like our local profile that are that's in with window within Windows. So we have desktop, we have documents, downloads, music, pictures, public, and videos and such, right? And by default, command prompt also starts within your local profile. So let me just type in dir. Look familiar? Desktop, documents, downloads, videos, and such. So the starting position is exactly the same. And let me prove it to you visually. I know here you can see that it says C users BUCO, which is the name of the local profile that I'm using right now within Windows. The only difference is the name of the local profile that I'm using in Linux, which is Koboman. So let me show you exactly the same navigation. In order to do that, we're going to have to use a couple of different commands just to kind of demonstrate my point. So if I type in ls at this point, it's going to select everything that's there. If I type in cd, change directory, and go to home, type in home, it's going to take us to our home directory. And guess what's inside of that? This is the exact same thing as users that's in within Windows. So if I type in ls, we can see there's one local profile in there, like I said, which is Kobuman. So if I type in change directory, C-O-B-U-M-A-N, and then hit enter, guess what's going to happen? It's going to take us back to our exact same starting point that we are, that we were at, and it'll be identical to the Windows version, which is users, and then name of my local profile. The only difference is 
in Linux, it's called home instead of users. So we are within home, which is identical to users. And now we're going to navigate to its local profile, which is Kobuman. On this other side, it's B-U-C-O, which is the current local profile. And if I hit enter, there we are. And I type in LS. We're back inside of our local profile, just like the exact same starting point that's in within Windows. All right, let's move on from there and start to look at some other basic stuff that we can find. In order to show hidden files within Linux, just like they are hidden in Windows, we have to type in ls, list the current content of the directory or the one you specify, and then type in dash a. This will tell it to show all the hidden files. So if I hit enter, it won't just list the contents there. Anything that's hidden will also be shown. You see that? Now it shows quite a bit more as opposed to just regular LS, which is here. This is regular LS. And here is LS dash A. There's quite a bit of stuff that's hidden there by default, just like in Windows. If you go into Windows and enable show hidden files, I guarantee you there'll be some stuff that comes up on desktop or anywhere else that there are hidden files, obviously. Now, before we proceed, I just want to point this out. I uh, made this, uh, okay, so I made this mug. I was thinking about a design and like it's my first time actually making a mug. So I decided to base it off of uh, my work motto. Sometimes I get, you know, well, you know, who doesn't? But, you know, sometimes you do get stressed out at work or, or there's just so much work. And then my motto is, this is what I tell people, I click, I get paid, I don't know. You know, what can you do? It's just another day and there's no point of getting stressed out. So I came up with this funny motto and I decided to make a mug out of it. And I only, uh, I put it up for sale for five days. There's a link in the description if you're interested and it's only $9.99 plus shipping. All right, let's get back to the video. So now that we know how similar it is to Windows, now we can proceed into navigating and trying to open up some files that we can potentially edit. So let's go ahead and clear our content that are within our command line. And that's very simple, actually. You just type in clear. This is pretty cool, actually. And now we are back at our starting point. So let's start moving up in our directory, kind of navigate through. Now we already know that if we type in CD, it's going to change our directory. And I'm going to move one level up. I'm going to type in LS again to see what's inside of it. And then I'm going to look for a random folder that I'm going to pick. And I think I'm going to go to var. I'm going to go to var and see what's inside of that, right? So I'm just going to type in CD VAR. And uh, now that we are inside of VAR, I'm going to type in LS again to see what's inside of that. And then, you know what? I think I'm going to go to www folder, right? So I'm just going to type in again, change directory, www, right? I'm going to hit enter. And same thing, I'm just going to hit LS and see what's inside of that. So we can see there's HTML folder inside of that. Now that we listed it, let's, so let's navigate into that. Change directory, HTML, that's the name of our folder. Now let's see what's inside of that, LS. We can see there is a file in there, an HTML file called index.html. And that's awesome, right? So the way we got to this was actually going one level at a time, one folder at a time. And that's fine if you feel comfortable with that. However, if you know the exact location of index.html, you can simply navigate to it directly without having to go from one directory to another. So let me go back to where we started. I'm just going to type in CD. Here's our starting point. And from here, I'm just going to type in CD. And I'm literally going to spell out what it says here, just like so, including the forward slash here. So I'm going to type in forward slash VAR HTML. Enter, and here we are 
inside of HTML folder. And if we type in LS, we can see that there's index HTML inside of it. So let's see if there are any hidden folders, you know, in case we're, you know, you, you know, you're looking for something there and it's, you can't see it. We're going to do our dash a command and see if there's anything else in there. We can see there are some other folders inside of this. And if you really wanted to, you can navigate to that, change the directory, dot, dot. That's the name of the folder we have here. Let's see if we can get into that. And all that does is actually just takes us back down a level. So every time you see two dots like that, that's all it does. So I'm going to leave it at that because I'm trying to make this video very basic and simple. So let's go back to our HTML, HTML folder, LS again. And now let's try to open up our index.html as part of our navigation tutorial. There are a couple of ways of doing, of doing this. And it's kind of similar to what happens when you open things in a notepad. And the reason I say that is because Linux uses a couple of different text editors. And one is called VI. So simply in order to, you know, to open index.html, you can simply just type in vi index.html. So if I hit enter here, it's going to open it up in this editor. In order to navigate through it, you just use your arrow keys. Just like so, let me, uh, just like so, you can use your arrow keys, you can navigate through it, right? However, I don't like to use this editor. So I'm going to move on to another one that which I think is much cooler. If you happen to be inside of this one to exit it, you will have to do colon command. So if you hold shift and press colon and then type in X, it's just going to exit it without making any changes. And here we are back at our main screen. The one I like to use and I'll show you why. It's called nano, nano editor. So if I type in nano, nano, and type in index.html, and I hit enter, it actually looks quite a bit different. Let me just move this here for a second. You can see that some things are color coded and, you know, looks much nicer. Not only that, we have a list of commands down here handy. I mean, sure, you can always, you know, try to look up commands for VI and you know, this and that. I mean, yeah, of course you can, you know, remember them, but I like nano because, you know, it gives you a little bit more to work with. At least I don't have to remember everything, you know, especially if you're new, if you don't to, you know, if you don't want to go back and, and look up everything, all the commands for this and that, you can simply just use nano and it'll give you some instructions right down here. So in order to use nano, we have to use our control function. So what we do is basically hit control and hold it. And for example, we can see here that says, if you want to go to next page, you do control V. So if we just, we are already holding control and we're just going to press V, it's going to go to the next page. And if we control V again, it's going to go next page again. And then if we want to go back, we can do control. And then it says here, why? So we're going to press Y. And that, you know, basically will do it. And you can do the same thing when it comes to these, all of these instructions here, right? And one thing I like also about nano is you can simply start typing things. So let's go ahead and navigate just a random place, right? And I'm just going to type in test of the word editor, right? You can just start typing. Um, in VI, you actually have to execute another command in order to start typing anything. In nano, you don't have to. You can just start typing. And if you want to save something, and uh, of course, I'm you know making it again. I'm trying to make this really simple because for this video. And if you want to save something, we can see there is an exit command right here, and it's Control X. And this is a really cool part about it. So if I'm holding control and I hit X, you get this window and it's asking you, Hey, do you want to save this or do you want to cancel? And it tells you what to press exactly. 
And you don't have to hold anything at this point. You just press Y, N, or C if you want to cancel. And in my case, I'm not going to save anything. So I'm just hit no. I'm not going to save anything. And there they are. And there, and there it is, I should say. It's, it's, you know, it just exits and goes back to the main command line where you start and drop that off, right? Well, there you have it, guys. That is the video on simple navigation within Linux. I hope this video convinces you to start using Linux, start learning a little bit of Linux, because it's pretty cool, especially if you want to set up a server that you want to test, like, for example, your website, you know. Matter of fact, it just so happened that we were looking at our index.html, which is your starting page for a website, right? All right, guys, if you like this video, please share it with friends. Also, check out all of my other videos if you're into that type of stuff. Oh, yeah, I already showed you this. And I have a website, a forum website, in case you have any questions. And, of course, I'll answer any questions you may have at the bottom of this video if you want to leave them there. But I also have a forum if you'd like to go there and uh, participate. And lastly, I have massive amounts of videos. I think I have almost 400 different videos on all kinds of different IT stuff. So if you want to check that out, it's all available at my channel, youtube.com forward slash Kobu Man. All right, guys, I wish you best of luck with all the things that you're doing in life. And you have a wonderful day. Bye-bye. Hello my friends, my name is Irvin, also known as Kobuman. This is a continuation of Microsoft Azure platform. We're going to be learning new things today. In the previous video, I've talked about on how to create different virtual machines on the Microsoft Azure platform, how to create them, how to configure them, and how to monitor them for different issues. Amongst other things that I've talked about in the video, it's really good idea to actually look at that and watch that first video in order to get a really good introduction of what Microsoft Azure is. As promised in that video, I'm going to continue with the second video that will be about storage accounts and we're going to create file shares inside of that storage accounts and then we're going to add those file shares into our virtual machines which are going to appear as shared drives. So if you do tech support, you're familiar with shared drives which is something that you would add to the users a computer in order for them to access it for storage. So again, I highly recommend that you watch the previous video as an introduction so that way you can follow along. Of course, I will have a pop-up link right here on the right-hand side that you can simply follow and at the end of this video. All right, guys, that being said, please take one second to like my video. That really makes a huge difference for me. Thank you so much. I appreciate your support on this. All right, guys, let's get into it. And here we are in our home uh, page of Microsoft Azure. From here, we can click storage accounts, but another way to find storage account is to click on the little hamburger icon and just go down and select storage accounts. So let's go ahead and click storage accounts and we're going to create one. You already can see that I already have one and that's related to the fact that you gotta have one in order to store your virtual machines or anything else that you create that requires taking up space or storage, right? So of course, we're going to have to have, um, you know, a storage account already. But for this, we're going to create a special one just for file storage. So from here, we're going to click add, and then we're going to create one. And the reason we're creating one is related to billing mostly. So Microsoft wants to know you know, what are you using things for? Just like we created different resource groups for our virtual machines, Microsoft wants us to create a separate group for the storage accounts. So it's kind of related to billing, so that way they know what that is used for, so that way they can bill you for it. Kind of similar to what we had in our virtual machines, the first thing that comes up is to select our subscription. And again, subscription is basically 
the subscription that we're using for the Microsoft Azure platform a way to bill you basically, just like you have, for example, Netflix subscription or anything else. So you tell it, okay, I want to use this one. In our case, it's already selected. And then here we're going to select resource group. As I mentioned in the previous video, every time you create a resource group, which is what we've done in the previous video, you want to make sure that everything else that you want it to be connected to that, you want to make sure you select the same one. And in the previous video, we created a group called Azure Tutorial. So we're going to select that. And just to kind of quickly overview why we're doing this, when you make sure that you are selecting the same resource group, you also make sure at the same time that you're putting everything on the same network. So with this way, it's going to make sure that the, you know, the, uh, that the network connections between all those virtual machines and the storage is also working in the sense that they are on the same network. It's going to reduce the fact that you may need to configure different security settings, this and that. It kind of puts it in the same network. You will have connections to it, and that way you are good to go, especially when you create later on a sync uh, storage, which basically what it does, it creates a backup of the storage that you're uh, creating. Otherwise, it's not going to work. So you got to make sure that it is in the same resource group. And in our sense, we're kind of concerned about the same network so that there is connectivity. All right, we're good there. And now below, we can select a storage account name. We can type it in. We're just going to call, call it um, new storage. And it doesn't like the caps, so we're just going to use lower letters. New storage is already taken. We're going to call it new storage one. All right, we're going to we're going to name it something specific. I'm going to call it Azure Storage. Let's see if it likes that tutorial. Is already taken. All right. Well, let's just leave it that Azure Storage Toot. We're going to leave it at that. So, uh, yeah, it's very picky, and uh, which is pretty common. So that's good. So the next thing we're looking at is performance. It kind of depends on what you're looking at. If you want the standard performance, you can leave it at that. If you want the premium, you can certainly select that as well, depending on your business needs. But we're just going to keep it standard for the purpose of the tutorial and that's going to be fine. And then we, we can click next here so you can see the networking, but if you just leave it at default, it should work fine. It says here, public endpoint, all networks. All networks meaning that all the network that you've created, um, you can leave it at that. And then if we click next advanced, you got different things that you can adjust. But as I've mentioned in my previous videos, I like to keep things simple so that way it's easier to follow. So we're just going to cl simply click review and create. All right, now it just says it that deployment is complete. We can certainly click on go to resources and go to it right away. But what I want to do actually real quick is make sure that at least one of my one of my virtual machines is turned on so that we after we configure our file share, we can go inside of it and use PowerShell to add that um, add access to the share that we create. So I'm going to click on the you know, the little hamburger icon. I'm going to go down to my virtual machines and I'm going to make sure that at least one of them is running and looks like my Windows Server 2009 is uh, 2019 is running, which is good. We're going to access that in a little bit here. All right, I'm going to go home here. And as you noticed in our home page, it gives you access to the most recent things that you've worked on. And here is our Azure storage uh, tutorial account. We're going to click on that. So from here, we're going to click on file shares. I'm going to make it simple. I'm going to keep it simple. I'm not going to talk about anything else that, that it isn't a topic of this video. If you have special requests, please let me know. So we're going to simply click on file shares because that's what we're creating. I'm going to click a little file share button here. And on the right hand side, we're going to, it's going to ask us for a name. So we're going to type in file share drive. And then right below it, it's super simple. I really like this. It gives you the ability to add the quota. So the size of the file share. So we're just going to make it 10 gigabytes. All right, we're going to go down here. I'm going to click Create. And something very cool happens once you create it. Uh, it it's very simple. It just kind of allocates 
you know, shared space. It's going to be super fast and it's already done. So we're going to click on that and see what's inside of that. So, all right, so with our file share drive selected, what we're going to do here is add a directory. So that way there's something in there. We're going to call it uh, user storage storage I'm going to click okay so it's going to create just a folder called user storage so that way once we go in there we're going to be able to see it once we connect to it then we're going to click connect and we're going to pick our j drive here so that way you know it comes up then we're going to click copy the clipboard we're going to back to our windows server we have powershell open and we have file explorer open you can see that there's no sh shared drive named j inside of it so we're going to paste our script in there and this is going to add once it connects to it it's going to add our j drive into it so just kind of bear with me here in a moment uh, the virtual machine is kind of running slow i'm not sure what's going on but it will add it there eventually so once it's done i will show you that it did it all right so you saw that it was uh, waiting for response waiting for connection and then verified the credentials and then you can see that it added that uh, J file share drive into here and then it came up in our file explorer right here and it says see, you can see that it says here 10 gigabytes and if we go inside of it we should be able to see that directory that we created and from here we can literally just put anything we want that we can create I don't know let's create a document test doc all right, and then once we get out of it, in order to do this administration of it, if we go inside of user directory, we can see that test document that it came up. So as one of the last things I kind of wanted to show you that is really cool about these storage accounts is that you can actually monitor them just like those virtual machines that I showed you before. So let's go on back to it. And then if you scroll down, we selected that our Azure storage toot here. If you scroll down, you can you know monitor the uh, its usage so you can, just like with the virtual machines you can monitor different usage and access at specific times and periods all right so why am i teaching you this uh well obviously so you can learn how to use it and how to administer azure storage accounts but there is another reason for implementing this type of shared drive is that you know, you can simply take that script if you want people to connect to it. And um, you can create that script. You can pass it on to people manually. Or you can create the script and set it up in Active Directory for a, pers for a certain group of people um, that work. For example, let's say you're in a business environment. There are five different groups. So let's say there is collections department. Let's say there is accounting department. Let's say there is a... Uh, I don't know, some kind of a tech department, and they all are going to be in different groups in Active Directory. Well, you can set up a script, what they call a post logon script, that will add these type of shared drives to them automatically upon login. So you can use this script, you can implement it within Active Directory to run it for that specific group or even specific user if you want. But let's stick to the group. So let's say you want all you know, collections department to have access to the specific storage that you've just created. So the way you would add it into Active Directory, you would set up the script. It's very simple. And um, every time they log in, it's going to run that script and make sure that they have that drive added. I mean, you can certainly you can specify it in different ways. You don't have to use this specific script, but this is an option and um, it would just happen. They would get this storage attached they don't have to worry about trying to add it the network drive or the share drive themselves all right guys i hope you like this video uh, again if you want to check out my intro i highly recommend that thank you so much for watching please take a moment to like share and leave any comments that you may have thank you for watching and you have a wonderful day bye bye Hello my friends, my name is Irvin, also known as Kubelman. In today's video, we're going to talk about a practical way of troubleshooting somebody's computer remotely without using remote desktop software. So there is not going to be any RDP action. There's not going to be any third party software that we're going to use to resolve this issue at all. We're going to use things that are at our disposal that we can do 
to potentially fix the problem. So this will be really good for somebody who does help desk or desktop support or even tech support at, for example, a local office or a branch. And if you got one second, please click on the like button. I really appreciate it. I promise you this is going to be a great video and I always appreciate you guys doing that. Thank you. All right, here we go, guys. I've created a couple of tickets that we can work on. And the first one right here, it says, my program is not working. Now, keep in mind, again, we don't have access to remote desktop. We don't have any tools like Dameware or VNC or anything remote that we can use or any third-party remote software that we can use in order to help this user with their issue. So their issue is here, my program is not working. And uh, in the description, it says here, every time I click on a program icon, nothing help, nothing happens. Please help me. Thanks, Larry B. So here's the thing. Uh, first thing we got to do is actually ask Larry what his PC name is. Once he comes back with that information, we can start to work with that. So you may have to call him, you know, talk to him and say, hey, Larry, uh, what is your PC name so that way we can try to help you out but of course be more professional like you would call him and say hey this is for example for example this is Irvin I'm with end user support and I have your ticket about my program is not working I can help you but uh, can you please tell me what your PC name is so we're, we're, we're what we are going to do with that PC name is try to remotely access it However, first thing first, thing first we got to assign this ticket to ourselves. So I'm going to assign it to myself. <laughs> I, although this is not a ticketing video, I want to make sure that that's happening. But so I'm going to actually reply here and also tell him, hello, this is Irvin with EUS end user support. Can you please tell me? what your PC name is. So, of course, I wanted to give you as detailed as possible how you'd work this. So this is why I kind of put this note in, which in reality, it should send them a, an email or a notification of some sort so he can respond to you with that information. Or again, you can just talk to him, call him, you know, get in contact with him to get this information. So that way you can take a look and see what's going on. Again, we don't have RDP, so there is no GUI that we can look at here. Uh, and uh, we're just going to use uh, PC name as that. So let's go to the PC, the, the user's PC, so we can find that out real quick. So here we are. This is the user's computer. So while they're on it, you can just instruct them how to get their PC name if they don't know how to. So you can say, Larry, can you please go to your search bar? And the reason I'm going about it in this way is because users are very familiar with the search bar because they always look at it. And you can just tell them, click inside the search bar and just type in system or PC or, or whatever you feel comfortable with because there are multiple locations where you can find the PC name. So here's just the system that comes up and then you can tell them, hey, where does it say system name? And here it is. It says Cobbleman 1. So once he gives you that information, we're going to go back to our computer. So now we know that the PC name is, I'm adding an internal note, PC name is Cobbleman 1. Now we're going to try to access it. Now, of course, while we talk to Larry here, we want to make sure that we know what which which uh, program is not working. So we're going to access that um, access his computer uh, using just over that network using using a file explorer over the network. So the way you do that is open a file explorer and just type in backspace or backslash backslash type in Cobbleman one and then another backslash. And then we're going to access his C share drive, which is should be enabled by default for your business. It may not be, but it really should be in, in a, a business type of environment. It should let you in. You may get a pop-up asking you to log in, and that's fine too. Just use your credentials, and if you have access, that's great. So once we're inside of C, right now we're connected to his PC over there. We can see that it's on the network connection right here. And then the name of his computer is Cobbleman 1, and we're inside of his C drive. We're looking at his C drive um, just using a file explorer. So he's using a program, right? He's using a program, and we know it's not working. And then we're going to ask him, which program is it, right? And then, 
Of course, since we don't have remote desktop, we can't initiate the repair. Normally, you can just repair the program, and a lot of times that would fix it. You know, uninstall it, reinstall it, and whatnot. But if you don't have that option, or user doesn't, you know, have the admin privileges to do it either, and again, you don't have remote desktop of any type of software, we're going to try to fix that by going to his local profile, because in this case, if we go back here, it says nothing happens when he runs the program. So what do you suspect? Suspect? I suspect some kind of configuration issue or just corrupted data or a cache uh, inside of his local profile where the configuration resides. So we're going to go inside of users folder and we're going to look for his local profile. We're going to ask him what is your local profile name and then he's going to tell you what his local profile name which is going to be the same thing as his login so we're going to pretend that the, his login is buco we're going to go inside of that and typically typically configuration data for any type of program that's run there on that's run under your local profile is going to be in app data folder so we're going to click on app data and then a lot of times it's either going to be in local or roaming so let's have let's go into local folder and see what happens so let's say he has problems with adobe we can simply uh, just to kind of clear the catch we can simply rename this folder into adobe old for example and as long as his program is not open it's going to let us rename it like that and this is okay and uh, because once he launches adobe it's going to create a new version of the same folder and just to kind of show you what's inside, we're going to go inside of this and you can see that if you kind of browse through, you can see that it's either empty and a lot of times, um, you know, I, I pick this randomly, but there will be some configuration data like config files and this and that. But since it's at the local profile level, it's not necessarily something that's part of the program uh as, as in program that it needs to function it's something that's created for the local profile as the part of the configuration for that profile and the same thing happens with anything else for example this google here you know if you go inside a google here folder uh, and if you go you can see that it's a chrome and if you go inside of that you can see there's user data again this is what i talked about and if you for example go to default you can see that there is a cache data inside of it and of course you can find things like uh, i don't know their uh, favorites and stuff like that which is by the way missing on this one uh, but that's okay so let's stay on track here since we messed with adobe i'm going to tell them go ahead and adobe, uh, try to open adobe again so let's go back to the user's computer all right so we're back at the user's computer we don't need this window anymore actually i'm just going to yeah let's close it we're going to close it and then we're going to you know I'm, I'm so in this at this point i'm telling them okay go ahead and open adobe so he's going to type in adobe and then we're going to click adobe reader we can see that Adobe Reader works fine. And let's kind of go back to our computer so we can see again what's going on from our point of view. We are now back at you know, our point of view as a technician. And we can see that the new folder was created for Adobe, like I stated. So that created new. And you can see that here that the date is 6-10-2020 at 1 p.m. And if you look at the time here, it's 1.01 p.m. So that means it created just like I said it would. And what that does, it basically resets that program. And a lot of times it actually resolves the issue. All right. Now, just in case you actually had to go in and change registry settings, that's, a, that's something you can also do without having to have a remote desktop, as long as you have the proper credentials to do so. So on your computer, on your own computer that you're using, your work computer, you're going to open up a registry editor, and you have to run it as administrator. So remember how computer name for this gentleman was Kobelman1 here? And let's pretend that we have to go into registry and add some kind of a function, some kind of key to make it work. We can do that remotely as well. So we're going to take Kobelman1, which is the name of his computer, and we're going to connect to it over the network registry. So we're going to connect to his registry on his computer over the network. We're going to click network. We're going to put in Kobelman1. We're going to check name to see if we can actually find it on the network. 
and it usually takes a little bit it depends you know on, on the setup but you can see that it found it and it's allocated on this work group but a lot of times it would just be a domain name which says new server zero that's actually the name of my work group for my local computers at home but it will be kind of the same deal when it comes to domain. It will be the main name first, followed by the computer name. So that means it found it. When it's underlined like that, it means it found it. We can click OK. And we are now directly connected into his registry. So let's go ahead and kind of navigate, see if we can find that Adobe. We're going to expand H key local machine. You know, it's a local machine on his computer. We, we are now connected to it. We're going to expand H key local machine. And guess the next thing we're going to do? We're going to use some logic here, guys, and we're going to just go to software. We're going to expand software because we know Adobe is software. Now, there are a couple of different places that it might be, depending on whether it's 32-bit or 64-bit software. But you can see right away that Adobe shows up here. So if you expand that, you can see that this is actually for Premiere Pro and After Effects. So that's not what we're actually worked on. We actually worked on Adobe uh, DC or Adobe Reader DC. So if we scroll down and expand wow 6432 node which indicates that it's a 32-bit software uh, we can now look for adobe here and expand that and we can now see that there is adobe reader there right there and then if we expand that there's dc and inside of that we can you know whatever we need to make changes to we can now go inside of its uh, remote registry settings and make any changes this, that we want once we make these changes, we can immediately ask them to try, ask the user to try to see if the issue was resolved. Okay, now let's look at another example here and another example of a ticket. Of course, finish up noting your ticket. I'm going to add internal note here first. I'm going to say issue resolved by configuration. And then depending on the environment that you work in, you may have to specify what you exactly did. In which case we did, uh, um, I don't know, reset config folder data. We're going to save it. And then we're going to mark it resolved, completed. And that's that. That ticket, oops. That ticket should be now gone out of our system. And we're going to now concentrate on this second ticket. All right, let's click on this ticket. This ticket is called, I am missing internet shortcuts folder. And then if you look in the descriptions, we can see that it says internet folder is missing from my desktop. So in this case, there is a folder or there was a folder on their desktop that you know, it was with deleted or it's just simply gone. Who knows? Maybe it was moved somewhere. That happens sometimes too. User would just accidentally, you know, for example, they would like, if you look at over here, they would drag it somewhere and it would go God knows where, you know. So typically you would say, hey, can you check your recycle bin? Go inside of your recycle bin and check if it's in there, you know, this and that. And yeah, definitely do all of that stuff. But if it's not there and you know it's just one of those things that you may have a copy of, you know, let's say you can't find it and then, but you can find a copy of, you can ask them, hey, does anybody else have a copy of it? Maybe I can copy it over because it's just internet shortcuts. We can certainly do that. Again, we're going to have to uh, get some information from them before we can proceed further. But we're going to role play. And then first thing, of course, we're going to do assign our ticket, assign a ticket to ourselves. And then we're going to reply to customer. Hello, this is Irvin with us or you can say tech support doesn't matter you know let's, let's do tech support with tech support or you know you can say help desk you know whatever your situation might be can you please provide your pc name so that i can restore your folder thank you Thanks you. <laughs> Thanks, Irvin. Okay. So now user has been asked or you can call them. You can talk to them. Again, we're going to go back to the user. And, you know, we're going to get that PC name. And in this case, we're going to pretend that the same PC name is Kobo Man. So we're going to keep doing that. 
the PC. Let's do this. Users PC name is Cobleman1. All right. So kind of same thing. And I'll, I'll show you something else just in case this doesn't work. Uh, we can go back into his, uh, you know, desktop. And then we can just copy paste whatever it is that, that they need. So let's pretend that uh, actually let's go ahead and just create a quick folder called Internet Shortcuts. Or f and now we're just going to copy pasta onto his desktop. Okay. Now let's go to his computer. Now we're at his computer and we can say, hey, can you please check to see if the internet shortcuts is back? And sure enough, there it is. But what if for some reason just using a PC name doesn't work? Some, there might be an issue with DNS. So just type in, in Cobleman1 and, you know, go inside of that, you know, shared drive or shared network connection, I should say. What if that doesn't work? Then we're going to have to get an IP address and see how that goes. So you can ask them too, hey, what is your IP address? And if they're like, uh, I don't know, uh, you can just ask them, okay, well, can you go command line this and that? But that's too complicated. So let's go back <laughs> and ask them to give us the IP address without any confusion. But But let's see what else we can do, you know. Before we do that, let's let's see what else we can do without actually confusing things and confusing the user. Because we don't we don't want to do that. We just want to find that out on our own. All right, let's go back to our own computer. All right, so let's say this this wasn't successful, and this didn't work, and for some reason we can't access it using you know Cobleman one, like so. Let's say that doesn't work. Let's say we're not able, we get an error, or it just doesn't, you know, it just says not found. Then we're going to find the, in, uh, their IP address and see if that works. So, of course, the first thing we can do is open our command line and do a quick ping. We're going to do a quick pingage. You're going to type in ping Cobleman1. And here's our result. And guess what it is? It's an IP version 6. <laughs> it's an IP version 6. I, uh, if we do this, it's not going to work. Nothing's going to happen because this uh, systems are not set up to, you know, what I call backdooring into a computer. Some people may disagree, but this is what I call backdooring into a computer. You can just type in and usually instead of just a, you know, PC name, you just type in the IP address and same deal. Let's see if we can get that C share. Yeah, it's not going to work. So now we need to actually find what the IP version or translated or I guess translated in, in a way, but what we're actually looking for is an equivalent IP version four of this IP version six uh, IP address. So this is IP version six that we're looking at here, but we want to know what the standard is, what the standard IP version four is. So let's go back to the user's computer. You can say, hello, sir, can you please tell me what your IP address is? And you can just tell them, uh, can you please go to the search bar and then type in, I don't know, there are a couple of ways of getting to it. I'm just going to tell them to type in network. And then the first thing that comes up is network status. And I'm just going to tell them, uh, why don't you go ahead and click on change connection properties. And then if we scroll down, it gives you a bunch of different information. Now here's our IP version 6. Remember, this is our IP version 6 that we tried earlier. And it didn't work, but luckily we do have equivalent IP version 4, which is right here, and that is 192.168.1.102. All right, let's go back to our computer. All right, now let's try that. So we're going to backslash backslash 192, and you can see that I accessed it before. So 192.168.1.102, and then C dollar sign enter and there it is same thing uh, that we can do with uh, what you might call it same thing we can do with the registry we can connect using the IP address but let's go ahead and take care of this user real quick we're going to go and copy the internet shortcuts folder back into their desktop and now that we are back at users computer now we can see that internet shortcut has appeared 
Now let's go ahead and do the registry edit thing. Reg edit. And then we're going to use that connect network registry. Let me just minimize this stuff real quick here with this so it's out of the way. 192.168.1.102. Okay. And again, it takes just a little bit to kind of figure out what's going on. And now it's actually asking me for login ID. So I'm going to use, typically you can use your domain login, but since I'm not on a domain, I'm just going to use a local admin uh, a local admin ID and password. And there it is. We're back at the same thing, except now we're accessing it using an IP address. So there you have it, guys. There are many, many different ways to deal with this. I, uh, these are just the typical ones that I go for when it comes to resolving issues like this real quick whenever I'm working tickets, whenever, you know, I work as a business system analyst, but I do work on tickets, especially nowadays now that we're working from home, so they need more assistance. So this is what I do mostly nowadays, uh, simply because different times, you know, different times, guys. So now I'm just going to finish our my ticket here, you know, made a copy of internet folder to desktop whatever you want to put in there as long as it's and detailed enough so that if somebody looks at it like your boss knows what you did and i'm going to resolve this and mark it complete all right that's that guys i hope you like this video please share it with friends let me know if you have any questions just want to say hi i like the, making these videos and again i appreciate you guys liking the videos they are um, th that what you do really, really motivates me so much, so much. All right, you guys stay safe, take care, and have a wonderful day. Bye-bye. Hello, my friends. My name is Irvin, also known as Kobuman. As you can tell by the video title and the thumbnail, today I will be talking about how to install operating system on 100 computers. And this idea comes from my article that is titled Top 10 Hard Desktop Support Interview Questions and Answers. If you're interested in reading this, there is a link at the end of the video to this article. If you watched my previous videos, I went through the first three questions and kind of uh, went and explained what they are about and provided some examples, which I will certainly try to do as well in the number four, which is the question we are up to in my video series, if you will. So when it comes to the way I explain things, I usually do it in four part answer, which consists of first thing I would do, second thing I would do, third thing I would do, and then last thing that I would do. The reason for that is related to the fact that you might be receiving this type of question when you interview for a job. So you want your potential employer to know that you are able to properly perform this type of a process or being able to resolve this type of issue. And it tells them also that you, the way you think is the proper way to go about it and also tells them that you're very knowledgeable so uh, this is a good way to kind of practice that. All right, so let's get to it. Number four, what is the best way to install operating system on 100 computers manually? Meaning you don't have an option to boot over the network or any ad automated system available. So typically in a large business, everything is automated. If you were to receive 100 computers, you can just connect them to the network. You would get host names for them and you would assign them you know, which operating system to install, which programs need to be installed as well, and everything would just be done automatically. You just kind of sit back and relax and everything's done. This is why this is a difficult question. And this is how I would go about it. First, I would make sure that all computers are connected to the network and turned on. And that will tie in a little bit later here. I'll explain that. Of course, if these are new computers and I have an option to image them before deploying, I would try to keep them in the same area for easy access. So since I don't have an option of 
automation, I would make sure that these computers are kind of gathered together in, in uh, preferably in, in the same room. I would connect them together, power them on, and everything like that. So that way they are uh, there for easy access for me to, you know, schedule a lot or, or start to re-image process on a lot of them. That's the point of that. Second, I would acquire host names for each machine so they can be added to the domain. This is why I was saying, first, I would make sure that all computers are connected to the network and turned on so that afterwards, I would acquire host names for each machine so they could be added to the domain. And for this to happen properly, all the computers need to be connected to the network and turned on. So this can be assigned through Active Directory, also known as the main controller. So you would go inside of the Active Directory and you would create 100 computer names, also known as the host names, and then you would assign them accordingly to all of these computers that are being re-imaged and uh, with it, with them being connected to the network makes it an easy process. Okay, third, because booting over the network does not work, I would create multiple OS installed medias to use, CD or USB. So this kind of goes back to my trying to keep them in the same area for easy access and that's exactly why so that I can use install media on them. Um, afterwards, I would manually boot to inserted media and execute OS imaging process. You see how everything kind of ties, ties in. The way I would do things, it's kind of systematical and everything kind of goes back to itself. This is a great way to tell your potential employer that you have a really good way of thinking on how to resolve these big issues because you know trying to install operating system on 100 computers and doing it in a an acceptable time frame you got to know what you're doing and have a good plan you know what i mean so lastly upon image and image completion i would ensure that each computer has host names attached and is added to the domain or a work group work group um, usually is used you know in a small type of business so I wouldn't necessarily worry about that if you're interviewing at a big company but you know you got to make sure that is added to the domain and host name attached meaning that associated with each computer in addition I would install any software required per department templates or requests and that kind of goes back to the part of automation that I mentioned earlier that normally happens is you select the type of software that you need and it would install it automatically. In this case, you would have to do it manually, install any software required per department templates or requests. So if somebody needs Microsoft Office professionally installed, this is what we would have to do manually for each computer. And, um, you know, you would have to kind of get that information to make sure you don't spend too much time installing stuff um, uh, that's unnecessary stuff, you know what I mean? Because you don't necessarily have to install the same program on all of these computers. Because who knows? doesn't mean that all these computers are going to the same department, so they may have different templates that you would use and go by. All right, guys, I hope you find this video useful. Uh, unfortunately, in number four question here, I, there was really nothing for me to show inside the computer. But if you take a look at my previous three videos that I made uh, in regards to and in relation to this article that I wrote, you can see that I provided some uh, computer examples um, so you guys can also learn from that. There will be a link at the end of this video. Uh, there will be icons or uh, thumbnails at the end of this video as I am speaking right now. I hope you guys like this video. Please share it with your buddies. Let me know what you think. If you have any questions, I'll gladly answer them. And you have a wonderful day. Okay, make sure you have a wonderful day because I really want you to have a wonderful day. All right, guys. Bye-bye. Hello, my dear friends. Welcome to the best all-in-one refresher course for IT professionals. Information presented is in question and answer format in order to simplify the memory retention. This video contains basic IT knowledge for the following categories. 
desktop support, network administration, system administration, web development, and help desk. If you appreciate this valuable information, please return the favor by sharing it with friends. And now, sit back, relax, and enjoy this fun video. Because this information is derived from previous videos that are based off interview questions and answers, I will be omitting first question because it relates to job interview. You've received a trouble ticket that PC monitor is not working. What is the first thing you should do? The first thing you should do is check to see if all cables are plugged in correctly. First check power, then video signal cable, and if both check out, make sure the computer itself is powered on. If asked for further as troubleshooting steps, explain that there is a possibility that video driver or PC hardware could be causing the issue. Question number three. What is safe mode? How do you get to it? And what is it used for? In order to reach safe mode, computer must be restarted, and by pressing F8 key before the OS loads, you will arrive at a selection screen at which you will scroll up to select safe mode. Safe mode is used to troubleshoot driver issues, hardware issues, and remove viruses or unwanted software. Question number four. What is an IP address and how to find it. IP address is a number assigned to your computer to identify its existence or location on a network, meaning that DHCP server will assign a number to each computer connected to a network as part of identification. You can find your IP address by opening a command prompt window, CMD, and type in IP config forward slash all. Alternatively, you can look at a at network adapter properties. Question number five. What is a default gateway? You can see what the default gateway is by performing an IP config forward slash all command through CMD. Default gateway serves as path to reach other networks. For example, in order to reach the internet outside of your business or home, you need a gateway that will open the way for you. Default gateway in a business environment is typically a proxy server. Question number six, what is Active Directory? Active Directory is a feature of Windows Server OS and contains user accounts, objects, host names, group policies, and the main services. For example, Active Directory will have information about a user login credentials. In addition, it can contain group policy that will apply different permissions to user accounts that belong to specific groups within organization within a domain. Question number seven, what is a domain? Leading in from the previous question, domain is a group of computers and users connected to a network. A user will have domain login access once their credentials are created, added to the specific domain within Active Directory. In other words, your PC login will most likely be a domain login. As a side note, PC host names must be added to the same domain, but user can still log in even if the computer is attached to another domain within the same network. Question number eight. You receive a trouble ticket that states, my printer is not working properly. It prints out weird pattern on the paper. Please assist. This issue is caused by a bad or wrong printer driver. Solution is to acquire and install a correct printer driver. Question number nine. What are some commonly used 
LAN cables. There are four different types of LAN cables. CAT5, CAT5E, CAT6, and CAT6A. CAT speeds are up to 100 megabits per second. CAT5E up to 1000 megabits per second. CAT6 up to 1000 megabits per second certified gigabit and CAT6A up to 10,000 megabits per second. All the speeds are based off 100 meters maximum distance. Question number 10. What is blue screen of death? Blue screen of death is most commonly caused by bad hardware. The error appears as a blue screen crash in the computer. Blue screen of death can be caused by hardware, software, or driver issues and conflicts. In order to troubleshoot blue screen of death, you will need to run a full hardware diagnostic on the PC and update all of the drivers. Question number 11. What is DHCP? DHCP stands for Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol and it deals with handling of IP addresses for all computers connected to a network. Each computer is allowed to have connection to the network or internet resources after DHCP server assigns an IP address dynamically. Dynamic type of IP address can change at any point. Question number 12. What is DNS? DNS stands for Domain Name System, and it reroutes known host names to IP address that hosts its service. For example, DNS for www.microsoft.com is located at 104.90.84.14, but it can change randomly. You can say that it serves as an address book for the host names, which are then translated into numbers in order for computers to understand it. In this example, it assigns and routes web address names to web hosting services. Question number 13. What is VPN? A virtual private network is commonly used as a secure way to connect from remote location to network resources in your business or company. For example, you can take your laptop to a coffee shop start a VPN and through it securely connect to a PC at work or access company's email and files. Question number 14. What is a ping command and its use? Generally, the ping command is used to determine whether your computer has access to external resources or the internet. Through command prompt, type ping www.microsoft.com This function sends four packets of data which are sent back as acknowledgement of successful connection. It also provides the latency results measured in milliseconds. Question number 15. What is a group policy? Active Directory assigns a group policy to each new user added into the database. For example, if you work in desktop support, your user login credentials and permissions will be assigned to a group policy. In Active Directory, you can take any user and place them into a group that has predetermined settings. Group policy can restrict, read, write, or execute and restrict access to network resources. Question number 16. What is a PST file? .pst is a file extension used by Microsoft Outlook archive file. An email archive would be commonly known as a PST. Question number 17. How would you change folder permissions? You can change folder permissions through group policy, but it can also be done at local level with administrator privileges. 
Under Folder Properties, select Security tab and then Edit button, after which a pop-up will provide an ability to add users and allow for read, write, execute, or full permissions. Question number 18. What is a difference between a switch and a hub? There are a couple of main differences between switch and a hub. Hub can be used to connect multiple computers to a single network, while switch can be used to create multiple segments of the same network. Second difference is that with a hub, all computers connected to it receive the data packets at once, which create latency issues. Switch can regulate this by only sending the packets to computer that requested it. Question number 19. How would you recover data from a virus-infected computer? In order to successfully and safely recover data, you would extract the hard drive from the infected computer, slave it to a second computer that has updated virus definitions, updated Microsoft patches and drivers. From there, you would scan the drive for viruses, and once virus is removed, you can extract the data that needs to be recovered. Question number two. Explain the role of Windows Server. Windows Server is an operating system that uses a centralized computer that provides specific functions, predetermined rules for users, and computers connected to a network. Question number three. What is Windows Domain? Windows Domain is a centralized location for user accounts, computers, printers, and security features as part of database controlled by a domain controller. Question number four. What is DNS and which port does it use? DNS stands for Domain Name System and it's mostly used to interpret domain names into numeric IP address. DNS uses port 53 TCP or UDP. Question number five. How many queries does DNS perform and which ones? DNS performs two types of queries, iterative and recursive. Question number six. What is Active Directory? A service of Windows Server operating system, Active Directory is used for user and computer authentication within a domain. It can also enforce security policies and install software to computers connected to a domain. Question number seven. Active Directory database is located where? Using file name ntds.dit, it is located in the system root folder ntds. Question number eight. What is a lingering object? If an object is deleted from Active Directory while the main controller is offline, it can create a lingering object. When object is deleted from Active Directory, a tombstone, which is a temporary file, is created, which then has to be replicated by the main controller before it expires. Question number nine. How do you backup Active Directory? Active Directory can be backed up by using NT Backup Tool that comes with 2003 server. 
With 2008 server, a command prompt is used to perform backup. Type wb admin space start space system state backup space dash backup target colon e colon. Question number 10. Do you know what garbage collection is? Garbage collection is a process designed to free space inside Active Directory. This is performed by default every 12 hours, a defrag function. Question number 11. Do you know what sys vol folder is? System volume folder is a directory that houses a copy of the main files found on a local hard drive within the main controller. This data is shared for purpose of replication across the main, for example, user logon scripts and Windows group policy. Question number 12. What is RAID? Stands for Redundant Array of Independent Disks and is used to provide data redundancy mirroring across multiple hard disks. It can also be utilized to improve read-write performance across the server by using striping configuration. For example, RAID 1, two or more disks with identical data store redundancy. RAID 0, two or more disks, data distributed evenly to improve performance, no redundancy. Question number 13. Which commands would you use in command prompt to test network connectivity? To test network connectivity, ping and IP config commands are used. Question number 14. What does IntelliMirror do? As part of Windows Server operating system, IntelliMirror provides assistance in managing user data, computer information, applications, and settings. This is used by user group policy that defines business roles, group memberships, and locations. For example, if a user moves to a different computer, the applications, settings, and stored files will follow. Question number 15. Explain what group policy is. A group policy is used to control users' desktops and computer configuration by creating a default template for specific members of the group. This makes it easier to control and process large groups of users. Question number 16. Can you name different types of email servers and which ports do they use? You can have two types of email servers. Incoming mail server, POP3, port 110, IMAP port 143, HTTP port 80. You can also have outgoing mail server, SMTP, that uses port 25. Question number 17. What is the difference between a forest and a domain? 
A domain is a logic-based group of computers, users, and devices within Active Directory. A tree is a collection of domains. In case there are multiple trees formed, a forest is created. Question number 18. Do you know what virtual machine is? Virtual machine is an emulation version of operating system. You can have multiple copies of Windows Server running on a single hardware platform. This is mostly done through third-party software. Question number 19. Do you know what tattooing the registry means? Basically, the group policy will make the changes to user's registry, but once the group policy is no longer in effect, registry values do not revert back, leaving them tattooed in, sort of speak. Question number two. What is a firewall? Firewall prevents connections between two or multiple sources. It basically blocks any incoming or outgoing traffic. Firewalls can be in software or hardware forms. Question number three. What is TCP IP? TCP is a transmission control protocol that deals with establishing a connection between computers before any data is being sent. In other words, it acts as a highway for data packets being sent back and forth used by various protocols like HTTP or FTP. TCP also sorts out data packet receive order. Question number four. Can you explain the difference between HTTP and HTTPS? HTTP stands for Hypertext Transfer Protocol, used by majority of websites as means of transmitting website data and it allows for use of hyperlinks. This protocol mostly uses TCP port 80. HTTPS is a secure version of HTTP that allows for identity verification and low-level encryption using TCP port 443. Question number five. What is a proxy or a proxy server? Proxy deals with filtering network traffic in a sense of preventing access to certain websites and can even monitor user web activity. To put it simply, it can block certain websites from being accessed, but it can also act as a measure of hiding the true origin and point of access. Question number six. Can you explain what UDP is? UDP stands for User Datagram Protocol. Unlike TCP, UDP is constantly broadcasting a connection signal which can allow for faster connection speeds. With TCP, you have to wait for connection confirmation which takes time. UDP sends out data without consideration of what it is that it's receiving it, sort of like radio signal. Question number seven. What is the loopback IP address? The loopback IP address is 127.0.0.1. As part of troubleshooting network connection issues, it is used to test network interface card for functionality. If you ping this IP address, it completes successfully, it means that your hardware is okay.
Question number eight. What is DHCP? DHCP stands for Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol. The main function of DHCP is to handle distribution of IP addresses on a network. IP address assigned by DHCP server is dynamic, meaning that they are leased and released dynamically. To explain it further, if you connect a PC to a network, it will get a leased IP address, and if you disconnect or move that PC, it will be assigned a different one. Question number nine. What is FTP and port used? FTP is a file transfer protocol used to transfer large files between computers with built-in ability to pause transfer of data. Ports used by FTP are 20 and 21. Question number 10. What is SSH and port used? Also known as Secure Shell, is used to establish a secure connection between devices which can be anything from computers to switches. For example, you can use SSH at a cafe and connect to any device anywhere by establishing a configured secure shell tunnel between two devices, making the connection secure. Question number 11. What is the maximum length of UTP cable allowed? The maximum length of UTP is 90 to 100 meters for a single segment connection. If you have a switch or a repeater, it can compensate for this limitation. Question number 12. What are the layers of OSI model and how many? There are seven layers of OSI model, physical layer, data link, network, transport, session, presentation, and application. Question number 13. What is the job of network layer? A textbook answer for this question is that network layer deals with routing, switching, and transmission of data from one point to another, but this layer is also responsible for error handling and packet sequencing. Question number 14. Can you name different types of network cables? CAT5 runs at 100 megabits a second maximum speed. CAT5E can run up to 1 gigabit a second. And CAT6 can run up to 10 gigabits a second connection speeds. All cables are limited to 100 meter distance in order to run at optimum speed. Question number 15. What is a subnet mask? Subnet mask dictates the size of a network and also tells which part of the subnet our host IP address belongs to. Basically, you can have multiple subnetworks for a given IP address range. Question number 16. Can you tell me the difference between a workgroup and a domain? With a workgroup, you have a collection of systems that are connected to the same network, but have their own set of rules and permissions set at a local level. With a domain, you have a group of systems that are bound by the rules of centralized authentication server. In a domain, each system has to connect through the domain server using provided credentials. Question number 17. 
Question number 17. How would you determine connection path between local host and a server? A trace RT command is used to accomplish this test. Similar to ping command, with addition of letting us visualize which routers or switches are used to connect in reaching of our destination. Used for troubleshooting dead connections. Question number 18. Can you explain ipconfig? ipconfig command is used to determine TCP IP settings, DHCP configuration, DNS, default gateway, and subnet mask. It can also be used to change local DHCP settings, for example, ipconfig forward slash release and forward slash renew. Question number 19. What is VPN? A virtual private network allows users to create a secure connection over public network such as internet. This is commonly used by mobile workers in order to access company's network from a remote location. Question number one. What is the importance of doc type in HTML. Doctype tells the browser which version of HTML XHTML standard is used and how to render the page. Question number two. What is the difference between display none and visibility hidden? Display none removes the element from the flow, allowing other elements to fill in. Visibility hidden only hides the element, but space is allocated for it on the page. Question number three. Considering the code, what font size will have the text inside the P element? The answer is 8 pixels, because EM units represent percentage of its parent. In this case, it is a half of 16 pixels. Question number 4. What is the difference between session storage and local storage? Session storage is available only when a browser's tab is opened. Local storage survives on closing and reopening a browser. Question number five. What are data attributes? Data attributes are used to store custom data directly inside HTML tags. They are easily accessible from CSS and JavaScript. Question number six. Explain the difference between normalized CSS and reset CSS. Resetting removes all the native styles provided by browsers. Normalizing is just a correction of some common bugs. For example, SUP and SUB elements will work as usual after normalizing. Resetting would make them look like plain text. Question number seven. What are sprites? What is their purpose? CSS sprite is merging multiple images into a single image. It reduces the amount of web requests and increases page speed. Question number eight. What is 
SVG. SVG stands for Scalable Vector Graphics. It is used to show vector graphics on the page. The biggest benefit is that SVG images don't lose quality when zoomed or resized, unlike JPEGs. You can easily change the size, color, and animate SVG images. SVGs also can be bundled in SVG Sprite. Question number nine. What are the new features of HTML5 standard? HTML5 added new semantic elements, such as nav, article, section, header, footer, and the side. Also, HTML5 standard added new form controls, such are calendar, date, time, email, URL, and search. In addition, better support for embedded media using audio, video, and canvas. And while we take a short break, I just wanted to mention a few things that are available on my channel and CosmicNova.com website. We have videos and articles on various different topics, including desktop support, network administration, Microsoft system administration, help desk, customer service, and many more tutorials at youtube.com forward slash Kobuman channel. If you're interested in further expanding your knowledge, I have provided a link to some learning material from Amazon affiliate in the description box below. Question number 10. What is a CSS preprocessor? CSS preprocessor is a tool which allows you to create CSS code much faster in a more structured manner. Preprocessors extend the CSS functional by adding variables, mixins, partials, also allowed to use operation inside the code. Question number 11. What is microdata? Microdata is a set of additional HTML tags for specifying the additional semantic information to help the search engines read your site properly. Question number 12. What tags are used to make a table? Table tag is used for wrapping a table. TH tag represents of the table heading. TR tag creates a table row that stores the data elements. The TD tag represents column in a row. Question number 13. What is the CSS box model? Box model represents a structured way to space elements in relationship to each other. It is made of margins, borders, padding, and content. When the page is being rendered, the browser shows each of the elements as rectangular, which can be styled using CSS. Question number 14. Consider this code. What color will the text have? The answer is blue, because exclamation mark important overrides every other selectors, including inline added into a tag. Question number 15. What is the reason for wrapping the entire content of JavaScript source file into a function? This is one of the best practices which creates a private namespace and thereby helps avoid potential name conflicts between different JavaScript functions and external libraries. Question number 16. How would you inspect a hover state of an element in the DevTools? 
To open it, click the small colon HOV text in the top right corner of the Styles pane, as pictured here. Question number 17. How would you edit HTML in the DevTools? Right-click on the text you want to edit on the HTML pane. Choose Edit as HTML, make your changes, and press Enter. Question number 18. What is the difference between in quotes double equals and in quotes triple equals operators in JavaScript? The in quotes triple equals operator behaves identically to the equality of in, in quotes double equals operator, but more strictly. The types must be the same to be considered equal. Question number 19. What kind of loops are in JavaScript? Loop 4 goes through an inner code a number of times. For forward slash in used for looping through the properties of an object. While goes through an inner code while a specified condition is true. Do forward slash while also goes through a block of code while a specified condition is true. Question number 20. What would be a result of this code? The result is a string in a console. My pet's name is Roomba. Even though the function was called its declaration, the code works because of hoisting. Ladies and gentlemen, we have some bonus questions. Question number 21. What would be the output of this code? Explain your answer. The answer is global scope equals one, scope A equals two, scope B equals undefined, global scope after launching function equals one. In the first log line, X is obviously one because it was assigned one globally at the line where X equals one. In the second line is X is two because it's reassigned inside the function A. Inside the function b, x is undefined because it was declared but without any value. At the fourth line, the x is still 1 because a local function scope doesn't change the global scope. Question number 22. What would this code show in the console? This code shows uncaught syntax error, unexpected identifier. We have two assignments in the IIFE, B equals five and var A equals B. A is a local variable because it is declared using var. B is declared without var and should have been visible from a global scope. But we are using the strict mode, therefore B doesn't need to be assigned to the global scope. Question number two. Are you able to communicate effectively with customers? Meaning, how good are you at dealing with customers? You can talk about previous experiences and how you were able to resolve customer issues effectively 
and professionally which has left customers happy. Question number three. If you came across an angry customer that is very difficult to deal with, how would you handle this situation? For this answer, simply state that you would let the customer explain the situation and then in a very polite, calm manner, attempt to assist the customer. You can provide a successful past experience to explain your answer. Be careful because interviewer may ask what if customer was still angry and you could not deal with him or her. In this case, you would state that as a last resort, you would transfer them to someone else. Make sure that interviewer knows that you did everything you could in order to help the customer. Question number four. What makes a good customer service representative and how do you present yourself? You can answer with good listening skills, being very informed, having a friendly attitude, being considerate and patient with customers. If you feel any other skills are important, you can list them as well. Question number five. Do you have any sales experience? If you have any experience in sales, you would explain in what and what your best achievements are. For example, I had $100,000 in sales working for this company. You can speak of any relevant work which will increase your chances of acquiring this job. Question number six. How much of experience do you have in answering calls or working in a call center? Talk about any call center experience you have or any previous experience that involves communicating with multiple customers. Explain how you are able to handle multiple tasks at once. If this is your first time applying for a call center job, do not say that taking calls is the same thing as dealing with multiple customers somewhere else. I advise that you only say it is similar. The interviewer will almost always disagree if you say it's the same thing. Question number seven. Do you know how to use computers? This question may be specific to Microsoft Word, Excel, and etc. Talk about past experience and knowledge in using computers and in which manner. For example, I use this program to do this at this job. Question number eight. Are you a team player? This question only has one answer and that is yes. However, you may need to provide an example in which teamwork was required and how you've enjoyed the experience. Question number nine. Have you used any ticket systems in the past? This question is specifically designed for call center type of customer service, and it should be answered by simply stating which ticket systems you are familiar with. Question number 10. Did you ever go an extra mile for a customer? Meaning, what did you do to make the customer happy? You can provide a scenario in which customer had 
any issues that was not possible to be solved by only yourself and you had to reach to someone else for assistance. For example, you don't have this product, but the other location does, and you went an extra mile to help the customer acquire this item or service. Any example in which you had to go beyond your typical interaction with customers should be presented here. Question number 11. Do you do well under pressure? The answer should always be yes and explain how you would try to stay organized in order to deal with multiple tasks at hand. Question number 12. How do you stay organized? This is a follow-up question that you can answer by explaining your typical way of staying organized. Talk about prioritizing tasks based off urgency and ability to resolve issues in the most efficient manner. Be careful when making statements like this because follow-up question may be how do you decide which to prioritize first? You have to be ready to give exact order and reason why. This will vary based off your example. Also, you can mention that you use some kind of tracking tool, Microsoft Word, Excel, WordPad, or a simple notepad and pencil. Question number 13. Are you good at selling products? Explain why by providing previous experiences at which you excelled as salesperson. If needed, repeat all of things that make you qualified for this job. This was mentioned in questions number one and five. Question number 14. Do you prefer to work alone or with others? Do not say that you prefer either or. To properly answer this question, you need to state that you are able to work effectively alone and do really well with others as a team player. This question is situational, which is why you have to be open to both scenarios and every company prefers someone who has both qualities. Question number 15. Do you have any experience in taking payments over the phone or taking orders? Provide examples of billing system you may have used or previous experience of taking orders to be processed. Question number 16. What do you like about customer service? This answer can vary depending on each person's feelings towards this job. The correct answer is an honest answer. For example, I enjoy helping people resolve their issues or assist in purchasing of products. Or, I like working in a fast-paced environment. Question number 17. Do you have any strengths or weaknesses? For your strengths, mention all things related to this specific job. Your experience and how you are dependable, hardworking, and honest. For weaknesses, mention only one, which has to be something very minor. For example, in my case, English is my second language, so I sometimes have to double check my spelling when writing notes or filling out orders, but have gotten much better at it. 
something small that you have handle on. Guys, thank you so much for watching. If you like my video, please like it, leave a comment, share with friends, and I'll see you next time. Have a blessed day. Bye-bye. Welcome my friends to another video. My name is Irvin, also known as Kobu Man. Today's topic is about email formatting and is incredibly important to learn this when you're communicating issues to a third party that has access to a certain system that you do not. The reason that is important is because if you don't provide the correct information right away, the issue is just going to take longer to resolve and this is production impacting and this looks bad so what are some of the things that we need to include in our communication with other parties we will go over here in a in a second but let me just tell you that i kind of got this idea from my previous video when i talked about pin command and a situation in which you may have to contact somebody else that's outside of your company or somebody that's within your company but you don't have direct access to that system and now you have to reach out to somebody else that you do not know. So if you want to check out that video, there will be a link right here. And also this idea for these videos uh, came from my website, which is cosmicnovo.com. And the article name is top 20 desktop support interview questions and answers. All right, guys, that is that that is all for the introduction of this video. Now let's get to the important part of this video and that is communication this is incredibly important to pull off perfectly the first time that you are communicating something to somebody so that way the issue can get resolved really fast and then you look good not just you but you your group also and your manager and then you know this could potentially get you a raise anytime you do a good job and make sure that you're professional about it, it always gives you a chance to get a raise all right, so let's have it in a situation where the website is down. So let's pretend that my website is down, cosmicnova.com, and now people can't access it, but they need to use it for everyday use. Let's just pretend that. So what do you do? You don't have access to cosmicnova.com. So now you have to contact the tech support or the webmaster at cosmicnova.com. So the first thing we need to find is obviously their email. We need to have their contact. And once we find that, we come into a situation where we have to contact them. So if you can't reach them by the phone or that you do reach them by the phone and suddenly they're like, okay, well, we need more information. Well, the best way to communicate that is via email in this format. So let's pretend that their email address is third party support contact at cosmicnovo.com, which is, by the way, fictional email address. It doesn't exist, so don't, don't send the emails to that. <laughs> Anyways, let's pretend that this is the contact email. So the next thing we need to uh, add on there is the subject line, of course. However, make sure you CC your manager or any other team members that you work with so that way know that they know that you are communicating this information to this company to this support and of course that they know that you are working this kind of tells them okay i'm going to add my manager at kobuman ah, kobuman.com so that way he knows that i'm also working on this you know what i mean you want to tell them that you're working. This is job security for you. You know what I mean? This is one of those things that people never really talk about, you know? 
we want job security. It's incredibly important too. It's just as it's important to resolve this issue in a timely manner, so there's no production impact, I want to also make sure that my job is secure as well. Why not take credit for something that I'm doing? You know, very simple to understand. And the next thing is subject line, also incredibly important. The uh, reason you want a good subject line is so that it gets attention to the of the person or the team that you're contacting right away. So can you imagine people getting hundreds of emails a day and they see so many emails a day that all of them just kind of look the same? So they are like, oh, okay, this is another FYI email. This is another email that's just like everybody gets this and that. Well, we want a good subject line that catches their eyes. So we're going to say CosmicNovo.com is down. So now whenever this email pops up in their inbox, they're like, oh, that looks important. So they're going to grab that and they're going to be like, okay, this is something important. I need to fix this right away which is great. Simple enough. We want the subject line to be incredibly important and eye catching, eye catching, because this is a big issue. Anyways, if you've never contacted these people before, you want to have a good professional introduction. And regardless to whether I've contacted this person before or this group before, I always do, I always do this. I always, uh, have a professional introduction regardless because I don't know just because I talked to Bob at third party support contact just because I talked to Bob last time doesn't mean that Bob is going to work on this email maybe Joe is going to work on this email next time so I'm always going to have the same introduction and it's very simple I'm just gonna say hello and I'm gonna say my name is Irvin with PC support at and then you specify this location you know city state uh country if you do tech support outside of country for somebody else you know that's fine too you just want to kind of specify who you are where you at and why you would want to contact them you know and then you can you know fill this in fill in the blank basically in this part of it so the next line we want is an important line as well we want to say we have received a report that CosmicNovo.com is either not working, down, or whatever the issue is for all users. So if this is extreme case scenario where the whole website is down. It's not just like part of the website. This The whole website is down, so we want to specify all users. Now let's go back to the we part. The reason you want to say we is because this implies that you work as part of a team and then more than one person, as in you, is aware of this issue. So yes, I said my name is Irvin with PC support at this location, so that's just me. I am working on this. That's all that means. However, we, as in team that I work for, have received a report. That means it makes it more urgent. So the reason I'm, the way I'm looking at it right now is from a psychological point of view to um, encourage urgency. And as you see here, this kind of a theme started from the top here from the subject line. This is incredibly important. You're a professional. However, there's a sense of urgency in a very professional manner and you're right to the point. There is no, you know, there's no beating around the bush as they say. So this is incredibly important to have. And this is how I format my emails. Every time I contact somebody that is, uh, that is a third party and they, I, and I need their assistance. So let's go further down. What are some of the things we need before uh, we send this email? Well, we need a lot of information. This is what they typically ask. How many users? So now you don't type this in in the email, but this is what they would ask. So you, you wouldn't type this in, but you would say as an answer to this question, you would say all users. So you can kind of use this as a template. Again, make sure you don't have the actual question there. So now the question that they would ask is how many users? And you say all users. Boom. All users are 
affected by this issue okay and i do know that i've stated this earlier as well but we're just going down the line in case it just kind of going down the line of the things that they would normally ask about and they would say what is the link used so you know this is definitely important um, in this case is a website so we would just type in cosmicnovo.com now you want you can be specific you can type in http forward slash forward slash cosmicnovo.com however it's https so this is another thing we need to provide as well now we're going to remove the question itself now we have is the link they use as in users they now of course if this is like some kind of a application or a software issue you know they may not la they may not ask for the link you know obviously because it's not a website if it's something else that they might ask which for example which version of the software are you using right they can ask that and then you can simply reply we use version for example 7.5.9 of this software right so that's in case it's some kind of a software issue but we're going to go back to our situational uh, thing where the website is down so i'm going to remove this so it doesn't confuse you so now we're back at this situation where just the website is down but the other thing was just in case it was an app issue application issue if you will so the next thing they might ask is when did this issue start this is what they would ask and the reason they would ask this is so that they can look at the log files on their end they can look at the log files and kind of help them narrow down what the issue is much quicker so think about this the website goes down let's say at 8 a.m so this is what i'm going to type in the issue was reported at 8 a.m and then you might want to specify time zone so i'm just going to put down eastern time for an example and then since we have that information i'm going to remove the question of it as part of our template and then we're going to just say it happened at 8 a.m eastern time so now they can go in and look at the logs from 8 a.m eastern time and then see what happened and it will help them resolve this issue much quicker when they have more information think about it it's kind of similar to whenever you do you know just regular pc support you know you know user reports that there's something wrong with their computer and they're very vague about it well you need more information to resolve it just the same as the webmaster or the third party contact for this cosmicnovo.com will also need that information as well so these are some of the very basic things that are a must when it comes to reporting an issue like this we have three different things that they can look at we can say that everybody's affected we can see that this is the link we can tell them this is the link that they use and they can see well okay well that's a correct link right so it's not a, a, an issue where it's a, just a wrong link because that happens sometimes. They have to ask this type of stuff. And then we know that the issue was reported at 8 a.m. That's when the issue started. Now they can look at the log files. So what else can they ask? Well, they can ask a bunch of different things, but this might be something that in, comes up in a follow-up email. For example, can you provide example ip addresses where i'm sorry off the 
PCs that use this website. So this is what they might say in a reply, you know, but we want to wait for them to actually ask this because if, if it's an issue where they can't, when it becomes more complicated, they can't figure out why it doesn't work because they, they might, might say simply, well, it works from our end, but it doesn't work from your end. So this could imply that there is some kind of a firewall issue that something happened on the firewall or a proxy for your business. And so for some reason, you can't reach CosmicNova.com. They may reply with this and say, can you provide the example IP addresses of the PCs that use this website? So that way, from their end, they can see if they can reach these, these computers and then see if it's a firewall issue or not. They may also reply and say, can you provide user or users to test with via remote desktop. So the reason they would want this is obviously so they can test the changes that they have or kind of have a look at this issue from a user point of view. Now you might want to be careful with this if it's a you know outside of company, but if it's within the company, this is perfectly fine. But if it's outside of company, then this would be a security breach. So you don't want to, you know, let you know third party support contact name Bob from CosmicNova.com access your company system. I mean, you know, it's up to you, but technically it's a security breach. So but if it's a, if it's a, somebody that works within your company that supports this website then yeah that's perfectly fine they work for your company it should be perfectly fine you know but they might ask for that but typically in this situation they would resolve the issue on their end unless it's a firewall type of uh, situation in which case they may start to reach out to you know whoever the uh, you know whoever controls that network whoever has access to the domain controller, whoever has access to the proxy, because it could be just a proxy issue too. We don't know. It could be that one of the load balancers on the proxy is down and they need to fix it so that it can provide proper routing and proper access to the external websites for, in this example, CosmicNovo.com. And then, of course, let me finish up our initial email you can just say thank you and then you can just sign off you know type in your name and then i don't know your signature might have more contact like you know your email at you know whatever it is and you know phone number for example i don't know you know zero 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 <laughs> and your title, of course, you know, you guys know how to set, you know, set up your uh, signature. And here I'm going to type in my signature here. business systems analyst. And uh, <laughs> that's that's an example of, of, of uh, my signature uh, that I use in my email, of course with the real information, this is all fake information. But that's how you guys do it. You know, at this point, you just kind of wait for them to reply, to contact you, they might call you, they might reply, they might send you a message over the instant messenger, who knows, but this is an example of how you would format the email and the information that you might want to provide to the support for this type of business. I hope you find this video educational and helpful. I uh, will be making more videos like this. I do, you know, YouTube as like a more of a hobby than anything else. So I don't release videos too often. But when I do, um, you know, if you want to see the notification, don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification bell. But I do try to release at least four videos a month, at least one one a week whenever uh, I have free time, as as you know here, I work as business systems analyst on my main job. But I do enjoy a lot to make these 
type of videos for you guys. All right. Thank you so much for watching. Please share with friends. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Hello, my friends. My name is Irvin, also known as Kobuman. In today's video, we're going to talk about Reliability Monitor. It's one of those tools that comes with Windows 10 that people don't really talk about or mention, but it's actually a really cool monitor that kind of uh, filters everything out for you when it comes to system issues or system events. So it's similar to Event Viewer, except it's a little bit easier to follow, a little bit easier to navigate through. And I'll show you exactly what I mean. So let's go ahead and pull up Reliability Monitor. You can simply search for it and just type in Reliability Monitor and what comes up is View Reliability History. Alternative way to get into it is through Control Panel. If you go to Control Panel, select Security Maintenance here and then expand maintenance and then from here we need to click on view reliability history we're going to click on that and now it expands our reliability monitor once more so what is again reliability monitor you can think of reliability monitor for example as a highly filtered version of event viewer so instead of giving you all the details for that one day on your computer, um, it gives you kind of filtered version of it that's much easier to follow. And it kind of mostly points out um, software updates and critical issues that may happen on your computer. It lists successful and failed software and driver installations as well, crashes, apps, and programs that stopped responding and other errors, of course, on a time-based scale. So what does that mean? That means it shows you events for every viewer, every day, I'm sorry, just like event viewer, except it's a lot more sp simplified and it gives you this kind of a graph with dates aligned as this. You can see the only main thing that keep in mind is that reliability monitor, monitor only goes back as far as one month. So it only gives you one month of uh, event viewing when it comes to issues on your computer, which could be good enough to kind of troubleshoot all the computer issues that are happening. So you don't necessarily need to go back over a month ago to figure out what is going on right now with your computer. On top of that, uh, reliability monitor, it can often provide important clues about the cause of sudden changes in system behavior as well. And that can be determined by the events that happened and it can also kind of gives you an idea why for example my computer is crashing what happened with the application why did it stop you know this and that so again it's an event viewer in a sense except it's a lot more user friendly if you will or IT support friendly. So with a reliability monitor, let's go ahead and look at an example. And here's a good one. It says here that on October 5th, 2019, something happened. So if we just click on this bar, we can see that it gives you the details as well, but it also points out a critical event with this circle, with a, a red circle with the X in it. And then we have the uh, warning one uh, war exclamation mark here which is in yellow and then we just uh, we have regular event here which is in blue so let's look at the first critical event and it says windows was not properly shut down and you can see how it's easily laid out for you and it gives you the date here and it says you know it's october 5th at 8 a.m and then of course on the right hand side of it you can click on view technical details which will give you more information on it if you select that so you can imagine you know your let's say your computer is unstable and says you know your computer is shutting down just randomly windows was not properly shut down so what does that mean it means that either somebody pulled the plug the power went out or something caused the crash so let's go ahead and click on view technical details and expands it and it gives you a little bit more information but as far as the computer knows it just it just knows that windows was not properly shut down so this could mean literally that it lost power and then it also in description it says the previous system shut down on uh, let's see what is this six days ago was unexpected so it gives you an idea that hey this happened also five days ago so that can give you a clue of what might be happening so you can either ask the user hey do you remember it shutting down before or you can simply confirm what the user is saying hey this happened before and then you look and look at it you, you can say hey did this happen about five days ago and then you can see that there's a pattern going on here so very similar to event viewer and of course i have a video on event viewer if you want to check that out i'll toss a link on the right hand side here 
So let's look at the uh, exclamation uh, one that it's just a warning and it says here Google update helper and it says unsuccessful application reconfiguration and it happened at on the same day at 808 um, a.m. So let's say somebody's complaining about Google Chrome, for example, because Google Chrome is the only product I have on this computer. And of course, it's going to have a Google Update Helper. And then I can see, well, all right, well, something's going on here. And then obviously it says here, unsuccessful application reconfiguration. So I'm going to click on view technical details and it's going to give me a little bit more of the information. And again, it kind of uh, repeats what it said earlier here and, and on the top and then in the description it says Windows installer uh, reconfigured the product and it gives you the product name and that is Google Update Helper and it gives you product version product language manufacturer Google LLC and then it gives you reconfiguration success or error status so at this point we don't know what happened because if it says unsuccessful uh, application reconfiguration as far as we know it could be just permission issues but at least we have an error status, which is the error code 1638. So we can simply Google this and find out on the internet what the, what this error actually means. But again, it could be just simple permissions issue, you know, and if user is complaining about Google not working properly, or Google Chrome or this and that, this kind of gives you a clue, at least a starting point. So let's just look at some of the uh, uh, blue uh, events that happened and informational events are down here and then again you can see there is uh, another Google update help, uh, helper and then it says here successful application reconfiguration and it happened kind of exact same time uh, where the where it unsuccessfully did it so that means most likely that it did get its uh, permissions that it needed to do so and then it actually did it so we can kind of confirm here that that well that was successful and we can see that the error status is zero so right away we can see well that's not the problem just because it failed here it actually succeeded below here so we're done with the google issue here and then of course we just have a regular event and it says here cumulative update for uh, .NET framework for Windows 10 and it says successful Windows update. So generally speaking, informational events are just that. It gives you information that something usually just happened normally and that is also good to know so that way we can kind of uh, exclude those things as possible problems for this PC. So with this tool, we can just keep going and scrolling through all the events. You can see some of them are just blank. There is basically just means there's no issues on those days. And then we got, again, just the, you know, the blue event that happened and it's just normal. But what, the ones we want to kind of concentrate on here are the ones that are critical events. For example, this setup host.exe stopped responding on October 13th at 8 53 a.m. and then we can just keep going and kind of look at those issues and what see what happened and it kind of gives you a really good starting point when it comes to figuring out what is wrong with all of these computer issues that may be happening and sure i can go through all this stuff together with you and let's just go ahead and take a quick look this one looks a little bit different because it's a setup host.exe and it says again stop responding at 8 53 a.m and it gives you quite a bit more detail and this is going to vary from program to program of course but again it gives you starting place to help you troubleshoot what the issue is and for example this one says stop interacting with windows and it was closed to see uh, more information about the problem um, check the problem history in the security and maintenance control panel so it gives you another starting point here it also gives you application path in some cases and you can see where this program is located and this is a windows component and then let's look at the same thing similar and it says uh, for this uh, yellow exclamation mark right underneath it, it says Notepad++ unsuccessful application installation. And uh, we can see more details of this one as well. Again, this one happened on 8.51 a.m. And it says Windows install, install the product, blah, blah, blah. And then installation success or error status. So this is most likely a failed installation and then we can look up again what the error is to clarify that information well there you have it guys this is a very useful tool in my opinion if you don't want to look all the information 
um, in the event viewer if you find that confusing because I can see how event viewer could be uh, harder to navigate through especially for new people to tech support so hey if you get an issue from a user or a report or user reports an issue it says hey my computer is unstable I don't know what's going on reliability monitor monitor is a good place to start to give you a quick look to see what's going on with that PC. All right, I hope you like this video. Please share it with friends. If you have any questions, please let me know. Leave any likes and I will see you next time. Thank you for watching. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Welcome, my friends. My name is Irvin, also known as Kobo Man. And today's video, as you can tell from the thumbnail and the description, it's about printers on how to set up a printer properly and the idea comes from my article that is about top 10 hard desktop support interview questions and answers that is located on cosmicnovo.com there will be a link at the end of this video if you'd like to read this for yourself this is a third video based off of this article first one being uh, remote desktop and DNS related. Second one being about missing files and desktop icons. Again, at the end of this video, there will be icons that you can select to watch either one of those. And if you're interested, I highly suggest that you do. Very interesting stuff. I go about uh, explaining these type of videos in a specific way where it's easy to follow for anybody. So today's printer, uh, today's printer, <laughs> today's question is related to installing a new printer at the office place that you work at. Now, before I go through it, let me just kind of explain my method of explaining this um, in a answer format. Um, I usually have four steps, and that is first, second, third, and last point or uh, explanation that I have for each a uh, question that is presented to me, especially if this is a you know interview question, because I want the potential employer to understand that I am, you know, very knowledgeable when it comes to IT, and you guys can do the same. All right, so let's get to it. The question is: Your office received a new printer, and now it needs to be configured for everyday use by a specific department in your building. So. Keep that in mind, it's for a specific department only. How would you go about installing this printer in a direct IP printing setup? The direct IP printing setup also being something to remember. And the way I would start to explain this, I would say first, I would unpack the printer to make sure all parts and cables are there. Uh, then I would connect and plug in the printer into the power and network port available at designated location. Also, designated location here is very important to keep in mind. So obviously, um, for when it comes to this, you know, you get that giant box and, you know, these are large printers for businesses. You know, you unpack it and then you make sure everything's there, right? You make sure it has all parts and cables and then you put it together, plug it in, and you know plug it into printer into power network port at the designated location second i would make sure that this new printer has a static ip address assigned to it and that kind of goes back to our designated location for this designated location where we have placed our new printer we have to kind of take note of the port that is there for the network uh, cable that is connected to right we, we, we would know okay well this is the port number for this, you know, for this location. And then we would talk to our network guy or we would do it ourselves and make sure that we have a static IP address available and assigned to it. So let me show you what I mean. If you go to your network adapter properties and look at the those those settings there, you go to properties, right? And you would make sure that you have a static IP address available to you. So if you have a static IP address that you want to use for that port, uh, this can be assigned um, through the switch itself 
and that port would simply just use that and it would never change and that's the whole point it's static we don't want it to change because we want users to connect to it every time so when you go here into the the ethernet adapter properties and select internet protocol version 4 if your company is using uh, ip version 4 you will go in here and if you have to you would specify the static ip address so i'm just kind of showing it to you on the computer itself but this is what you would do inside the printer you would say use this you know ip address if this is something you have to do this is just me explaining to you what a static ip address is and why you would need it for a printer so that users can always connect to it and know where it's at so that way they can install it on their computer afterwards and i'll show you that as well and also i would acquire driver pa package for the specific model printer unless the printer is set up to push the drivers automatically upon a request so if printer for some reason doesn't come with driver package or software obviously you would go to the manufacturer website download all these drivers that you need so let's say it's an hp computer it's a hp printer you would go to hp and specify model get this information and then the reason for that is if needed we would uh, basically go to actor directory and tell actor directory to push this driver but just kind of hold on to that thought uh, because most new printers automatically push the drivers so if it's a brand new computer a brand new uh, printer it would automatically push the driver to the user that is trying to install it and i will go back to the active directory part that i've uh, that i've uh, that i spoke about third active directory needs to know of the printer added so this is where that comes in it needs to be, it, it would know it needs to know that it's added and it added to the domain itself right active directory you know domain so what happens is you would take a host name you would create a host name for this printer you would assign a host name and then you would add it to the actor directory so that actor directory knows that there is a printer connected to this domain so that way it can control who can use this printer through gpo or a group policy and what this does is it only allows certain users of that department to use the printer so basically once you have a group of people group of users for a specific department you can literally just add all of those people into the permissions to use that printer that's been added to actor directory so actor directory is a simple simple way to control who can who can use the printer and who cannot and that kind of goes back to our part uh, where it's kind of related to the driver package if you have to specifically get the driver package you can set up actor directory to push the driver as somebody tries to install it so uh, but again new printers will just do this automatically on their own whenever somebody tries to add it and that is done by the uh, static ip address or the host name and this is why i talked about it here if driver has to be pushed separately this can be configured as well and in active directory lastly i would notify the users of the new printer and its ip address and assist accordingly so of course you would have to help them because that's your job remember how we talked about a static ip address here well your printer with the static ip address that you assigned it to would be used by users or you would do it for them let me just pull up my printers menu and here we would add our printer so the way would we would do it we know with printers um, menu we would simply just select add printer so now it's searching for the printers but usually you saw how that little that popped up this link it usually doesn't find it right away so you have to specifically tell it so with the users when it comes to users you would simply give them the ip address and say hey this is the ip address for this printer just add it in there and it's going to automatically install it for you but a lot of times you would do it for them so you just click this printer that i want isn't listed because it's not going to find it most of the time and that's okay 
And now we have this menu that you may be familiar with. Uh, and remember how we talked about that IP address? Well, here it is. We can add the printer using TCP IP address or host name. So we can either use the IP address or the host name. Usually what I do, I just, you know, go by the IP address because uh, it's, I don't know, it's just the way I prefer it, but it really doesn't matter. So you have select that and then we would select next and it brings us to this menu. Here we would, for example, just type in the, you know, IP address that we've assigned it and we would, in my case, I'm just going to, you know, come up with an IP address. Let's say it's 192.168.100.1. So let's just assume that that's where our printer is located and that's its IP address. And something to keep in mind when it comes to installing the drivers, if it's a newer printer, you'll be able to simply select the check mark here if not selected. By default, it is, I believe. And what that does is queries the printer. It pings the printer and says, hey, do you have a driver? And the printer says, yes, I do. And it then automatically installs it on your computer. So that's pretty awesome. Um, if you don't, you can later on specify the driver that you want to use. But this should be set up so it automatically does it. And then simply you will select next. And it's going to look for it. And then it's going to install it. Of course, I, I forget to mention the printer may have a port assigned to it as well. And uh, you would simply type that in after the IP address that I showed you. Okay, let's see. Uh, lastly, I would notify the users, the new printers, and the IP address. I said that already. And that was the last part of this. If you have any questions in regards to this, I know this is a little bit complicated. And that's the whole point. The title of this article is Top 10 Hard Desktop Support Interview Questions and Answers. Because, you know, you have to explain your steps on how to do this and I wanted to make these type of videos so you guys can kind of learn from this and to at least make it as easy to understand as possible. Whether you have experience or not, it's good to have this type of knowledge or refresher for, you know, uh, my friends that are already IT professionals like me. All right, guys, please like this video, share it with your buddies. I'm sure they will like it. And don't forget, I have those two other videos you can watch. There is a link in the description. And hey, if you want to check out my computer setup that I have, there's also a link in the description below. So if you want to check that out, that's cool too. All right, guys, I wish you best of luck and have a wonderful day. Bye-bye. Hello my friends, my name is Irvin also known as Kobelman and in today's video we're reviewing an awesome brand, an adapter that allows you to back up your data easily. However, this adapter can also be used to recover data if you're doing tech support. So let's say you have a broken computer, um, you can take that drive out of it, slave it to the other computer, and then you can recover data like so. But it is designed specifically to be used as a one-touch backup and I will go ahead and show you about that. So right, let's get to the unboxing. This adapter supports IDE 2.5 inches and 3.5 inches along with SATA connection. And I'll show you how it looks like. So here's what it is in the box. Here's the little uh, adapter that comes with it. You supposedly press the button once you install all the software and it does all the backup for you. But here's the main thing. This is three and a half inch IDE and I'll show you a hard drive that connects to it. And here is SATA connectors and here is two and a half inch if you happen to have one of those and back here you just have on and off switch like so and then of course you have the connectors for the power for the cable that goes to the USB and another power cable for SATA and I'll show you what's inside as well all right so that's the adapter itself let's see what else is inside The next thing we have is the cable that comes with it and here is this part of it. This is just Molex cable that goes in the back of your hard drive. I will show you that as well again. 
and here is the USB cable matter of fact we're going to connect that right away as I am unpacking this I'm just going to keep connecting it and this is where that goes you just have to make sure it's aligned properly and then I'm going to push it in so that's connected and again that goes to the USB all right I'm going to keep this here just for the moment and I'm going to check out the last thing that's in here I'm going to open that up so we can see what's going on with that so this is just a regular this is a US connection type uh, I'm assuming if you buy this from Europe uh, you get a different type of adapter and this is simply goes here just a power adapter similar to what you would do with a laptop or any other electronics that has an external adapter like so so I'm going to push it in snaps in just like that and then the last or a couple more things in the in the package itself here are the user manual instructions the manual itself also talks about a software that you can use inside of it and for that there is this CD that came with it so this is SATA hard drive so you just align it and then you push it in like that there it is that's already connected and then let's see I do have an IDE this is an older style of hard drive but you know this is why I say it might be good for tech support in case you're trying to recover some data or if you have like some kind of a shop that deals with data recovery and then this goes here IDE two and a half and I'm just gonna align the notch and I'm going to push it in and here it is it's connected like that and again we have this Molex connector which we're going to connect to right there Molex 4 pin connector pushed in so that's all connected now all we gotta do is just connect it to our USB and then connect it to the power and then we're going to test it into the computer right now so as you can see I have it just sitting here on my desk and then I'm going to take this USB connector and I'm just going to match it with the blue connector on here which is USB 3.0 so that way we get get the maximum speed after that I'm going to pop my CD in that came with the box I'm just going to put it in there and I'm going to install the drivers that came with it and then we'll see what happens so here we are inside the computer I'm going to open this PC I'm going to see what shows up you can see right away that both of those drives actually showed up and I'll show you what I mean so it's the uh, gateway the one's called gateway F this is a old hard drive from my old laptop and then there is a local H I believe those are the ones that are connected to that adapter so right away without installing any adapters it's plug and play you can see that it works let me go ahead and I'm going to run over to the computer over there and uh, I'm going to unplug the USB so we can see exactly again which ones do show up right away. You can hear me probably talk. I'm going to walk away just for a second here. I'm going to unplug it and I'm going to plug it back in and see what happens when uh, the, I do that. And let's see here. I have plugged it back in and there it is. All right, cool. Let's see what's inside of it. So now we can, I can recover any of this data that's from this old drive. And uh, this is the old gateway. Again, we can just recover all the data that's on it. So that's really cool. As recovery device, you can certainly recover anything. Now, if you happen to have a BitLocker locked hard drive, you're going to need the key. It's not going to be unlocked. Say, for example, this local hard drive C has a BitLocker but it's unlocked. If you plug in the BitLocker one, it's going to be locked, but you need a recovery key. If you want to watch video on that, there I have made video for that. I'm going to make it show up right here if you want to click that on how to recover data from a BitLocker key. So, from our understand now is that if you want to do one touch backup with this thing, meaning that the way is just sitting there on the desk, uh, you can just press that middle button there that I showed you earlier and it just does automatic backup for you for that you actually need to install this software so I'm going to go ahead and install it real quick so we can check it out so this is going to install this uh, one touch backup see it says OOTB 
And all right, let's go ahead and uh, install everything on here, see how it looks like. I'm going to create a desktop icon. I'm going to launch it right away. Check system settings failed. Let me make sure the program run on administrator permissions. Uh, yeah, that actually makes sense. So it did open it up when I closed that. Let me see what's going on here. I'm going to close it. All right, so we have the software installed. I'm just going to drag the icon here. I'm going to double click it. And it's asking to run as administrator, which is fine. I'm going to do that. And it says check system fail. Make sure the run is administrator. Okay, it is running. Okay. They came up three times. It's a bit odd. Um, anyways, the program came up after you click on it three times. And it's asking for a device. So I believe this is the device you are creating a backup to. So in our case, I'm going to I'm going to back it up to this one. I'm going to use Gateway F as backup drive. Okay, I'm going to use backup as backup drive and I'm going to select F. Okay? And it says here that it's USB 3.0 and its backup is uninitialized. So we haven't started it yet. He knows what it is. And then I'm going to click on the next tab. It says configuration. And I'm going to set it. Let's see here. I'm going to reset that. I'm going to set it as original PC. Uh, okay. And I'm going to leave the backup file attributes as original files. And... So basically what it says here, and it took me a little bit to actually read through this because I tried this a little bit earlier uh, and uh, it was a bit confusing to me to what was going on. Anyways, you're, you're supposed to set it up to original PC and it is now and you can leave it as original file is up to you. And then it's telling you here that it's going to create backup onto that drive, which is F. So that's where the backup is going to go. From here, it's F. From there, it's F, and basically meaning that that though that's the uh, that's where the backup is going to go to. All right. Now we're going to click on the third uh, thing here. It says OTB path. So this is kind of confusing here a little bit. It says OTB path. It says one touch backup path. But I wish it would kind of say uh, where what do you want to backup basically. So we, here we have to tell it that we want to back up certain things and we can select my desktop my uh, my documents i favorite which is typically what people do so you can just check all of these things and it's just going to create a backup of those of course you can also tell it okay i need you to back up certain things so if you go in a root to c here you can literally go to users and then backup entire local profiles of anybody who's there so right now i'm using yt login and uh, that's my local profile and I'm going to click save on that because I wanted to create a backup of that when I press the button and I'm going to leave this here. I don't have to do this now because I've selected the entire profile, but I just want to see what happens. So I'm just going to click save options saved. All right. So now it should work. Now we can, uh, you know, click uh, right here in the, in the in the system tray. You can see we can click start backup and then it's going to click I'm going to click OK it says error when searching files please check the source directories uh, okay well let's see if it actually created a backup so if I go to F looks like there's a folder that's called AI OTB I'm going to go here and check the backup there's my desktop there's nothing there it kind of looks like it failed didn't it OTB path Let's uncheck this. Let's just leave it root of C users. Maybe it doesn't like that in copying entire profile. All right, let's do this. I'm just going to tell it to copy documents folder. How's that? So that way we can test to see if we can just back up one folder so because because basically we can just go in here and create a folder it's called backup and whatever we want to keep keep everything in there and then do backups of that later so all right let's go do this and again we're gonna we're gonna try the one touch button thing as well so i'm gonna click start backup start backup backup complete all right so that supposedly work let's have a look in here so we know it's inside of f 
we go inside backup and C I'm assuming users YT login and documents okay so that works that's good so why didn't it want to hmm maybe it didn't like let's let's do a little bit of troubleshooting here I'm not gonna spend too much time on this did it not like doing this maybe it needed some other maybe that's where the error for the administrator privileges comes in start back up yeah so for some reason it doesn't realize that you've given it admin privileges to begin with and it doesn't like copying these um, directly but if you do go because I know I am logged in under YT login right now so let's see what were those things that I was trying to copy documents desktop and favorites let's see if it's gonna copy it now I'm going to do it start backup backup complete alright let's see if it actually did it okay so there's nothing in the desktop because these are system uh, these are in public uh, f uh, these icons are all in public uh, folder but there should be stuff in favorites and there it is so it works so you just have to fiddle a little bit with it the software is not perfect obviously there are issues with the software I mean there's no denying that I'm gonna go over there and uh, I'm gonna press that one touch backup button and see what happens on our computer so you can hear me talking and uh, walking away here, I'm going to press the one backup button. So that's what happens when you click the one touch backup thing on your desktop. So let's say you have it next to you. You can click to backup and then you still have to click OK. So I wish it was just doing it automatically. Maybe there's a setting in there somewhere. Let's see, an option where it just does it. Confirm before backup. OK, so yeah, you can uncheck that and then... You know, and then you can just press the button, then it should just do it. All right, guys, if you're interested in this product, there's a link in the description. Um, I would use this as something that you can access, like if you have a hard, extra hard drive and you don't want to, you know, you don't want to mess around with open up your computer and uh, trying to install a new hard drive. If you're not familiar with computers, you can just plug into your USB and just take that hard drive, plug it in, and just keep it on your desktop as a backup or you know to access that hard drive or you can use the backup features that's fine some people like to do that some businesses do that as well and um, I would personally use it in tech support um, if you are trying to recover data off a computer it seems to work plug and play which is great you don't have to install any software you just plug it in you you know can you connect that SATA or IDE drive on it and you can recover data that's mainly what I would use it for but it is good for backup I'm not impressed with the software that's on here. There are some, some, are some issues here, and there are some, uh, uh, I've noticed a couple of, uh, you know, typos. See, my computer is missing R there. So, in my opinion, they should spend a little bit more time on this software and figure out what's wrong with that. And But it works. It does work. It just does need, it need a little bit of a fiddling with. So... If you like this video, please leave a like. I'd really appreciate your support. If you have any questions or comments, I'll be glad to answer them. And you have a wonderful day. Bye-bye. Hello, my friends. My name is Irvin Olson and Kobo Man. In today's video, we have a refresh course for help desk desktop support or tech support in general. What I do is every couple of months, I would take the videos that I've made over that time and combine them into a single video that you can watch without having to go through and find these individual topics on your own. So let's see what we have. First thing, we have a real world scenario where the issue is no administrator access at local level. I will show you how to do that. I will also talk about BitLocker encryption and its use in a business environment. Third part of that is installing software through PowerShell. So it's an introduction to PowerShell and how to use it to install and uninstall different programs. It's really good to use for somebody who might be interested in that. Last part of the video talks about file association along with some Java troubleshooting. Guys, let me know if you like this type of stuff. If you have any comments, please leave them below and I'll answer them as well. And if you got a moment, please click the like button. This really makes a huge difference for my channel. I really appreciate that and I hope you enjoy this video. Thank you.
And in today's video, we're going to look a real world scenario in which you may come across in tech support. In this situation, we cannot access a remote computer so we can make changes to it or fix something on it. So what happens is we, for example, try to backdoor into it to make some changes. We would simply, you know, for example, type in uh, backslash backslash name of the computer that we're trying to access. And then we would try to hit enter and the error would be, well, you don't have administrator privileges, so you can't do anything with that. Or we are trying to remote desktop into it and it would be the same thing. We would type in the name of the computer, hit enter, and it would say, well, oh, you don't have administrator privileges, you can't access. So what seems to be the problem? Well, here's the thing. As tech support, you probably belong to a group, group uh, policy on the domain that has administrator privileges that's automatically applied to all the computers that belong to that domain. So in this case, what happened was is the chances are that that group policy hasn't applied to that computer locally. So let's say the name of your group on the domain. Let's just open sticky notes real quick so we can have a reference. Let's say the name of your group is IT support. You and everybody else that belongs to that group, you and everybody that belongs to this IT support group on that domain has admin access. So at this point, in order to quickly resolve this issue, instead of going through, you know, reimaging the computer, this and that, or trying to force any of these things, we can just simply add IT support group that you belong to with administrator privileges. We can add it to this computer at local level. And if you appreciate this type of content, instead of me playing an advertisement here, please take a second here and just click the like button or subscribe to my channel. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And this way I don't have to bug you with ads. So how do we do that? Well, first of all, we need to have a local administrator password or our local administrator login so we can make these changes locally. Obviously, uh, you need local admin uh, privileges. So what we're going to do is going to access our system with using local administrator. Now, this is one of those things that your company will provide for you. Uh, you know, if you have a good company that you work for, chances are that every computer that they have will have a backup login, which will be a local admin, local admin and will have a specific password for it. So you're going to have to find this out. You're going to have to look up the name of the computer that you're trying to troubleshoot. For example, you can see here that the name of this computer is called tech support. So you would access the database that has the passwords for the tech support, um, for, for the local admins on tech support, and then you're going to find that what that password is and what the login name for that is, and then you would log into that computer. In my case, I am logged in as administrator using this login. So in my case, it's YT login and it has administrator privileges and it's for this computer that's called tech support and I am good to go. Now I can make changes to the group policy that uh, has applied to this computer. All right, so let's get to it. Now, in order to do this, we're going to have to open up our local group policy. Now, this is the wrong thing to look at. A lot of people look this up and they're like, oh, well, how do I do this? Where is this at? This is the wrong thing. This is local group policy editor for the components of the window or anything that runs on this computer. So what this basically does, you would go in and, for example, allow or disallow a component of the windows or software to run. For example, it would say allow, you know, or, you know, or deny um, whatever is trying to do. Okay. And this is not it. What we want is actually called local users and groups. So in order to get that, we can type in lusrmgr.msc in our run command and we hit OK and it's going to open up our local users and groups. Here's where we're going to apply our changes so that we can go about our business and get to fixing this computer. Now, there are roundabout ways to get this and you can get to this through the computer management as well. If you go to control panel, click administrative tools and then select computer management, you can see that Local users and groups are here as well, which is the same thing as the window that we opened previously, like so. So it's the exact same thing. You can see users and groups here. 
it's the exact same thing as what we have on this other side. So that's one way to go about it. Now, you can apply this um, IT support group by selecting groups here in this in this left hand side. So make sure you select groups, not users. Users are just local accounts. Groups is what we want. So we're applying a group policy to this computer. And let me just expand this here so it's easier to see, a little bit easier to understand because I really want to highlight the part that we're going to make changes to. All right. So what we're going to do is add administrators group policy to it. So obviously we're going to select administrators. And you can see here, if you read it, it says administrators have complete and unrestricted access to computer slash domain. Get it? So IT support group belongs to a domain. Now we're going to add IT support to the administrators of this computer that is locally. And we're going to now do that and once we do that all the administrators all the people that belong to this IT support group will have administrator privileges on this PC at that time so the way you do that is simply select add and we're going to type in IT support and then we're going to click OK and in this case it's not doing anything because it's not it's just a fictional uh, you know uh, group policy so what happened is we would add it and then suddenly you would see IT support, a domain group policy applied to this and you simply click OK and possibly reboot the computer, but it should take uh, effect immediately. At this point, the whole point of doing this is so that not only will you have administrative privileges on this computer, now you can make any changes to it you want remotely or this and that, but everybody else that belongs to that group. So all the people that work with you, now they don't have to go through this thing of getting local administrator login, the password, this and that. Now you can make all these changes and then everybody can just log in. And that's the quickest way of doing uh, doing this. Now, of course, if the local group, if the group policy hasn't been applied to this computer automatically for some reason, that there may be some other issue that you may want to look at it. However, this is a quick fix and you can just go about your business and then you know anything else i mean there might be multiple groups that need to be applied to this it just depends in, depending on the on the system uh of the business setup that you have where you work at it's just going to kind of vary uh you know from business to business in today's video we're going to talk about bitlocker and its use in tech support or in a business environment if you will bitlocker is used for encrypting of your drive so for example let's say you have a computer at work chances are it will be encrypted with some kind of software typically it would be the c drive for example here so there are many types of encryption software and for example one of them is sophos but a lot of businesses are going towards a bitlocker because bitlocker is part of windows operating system and it's free and it's convenient and it works well bitlocker uses aes 256 encryption and that's another reason to use it because it's just about impossible to uh, decrypt it in basically access any data on it unless you have a key for it or direct access hardware access to it so in addition what i'm going to do is actually talk about how it's implemented in a business environment and which kind of uh, operating systems can't use bit locker so for bit locker to work you have to have windows 10 Pro enterprise or educational version of Windows operating system, meaning that if you have Windows Home operating system, you will not have the option to turn on BitLocker. You need to have at least Windows 10 Professional. So that won't work if you have Windows Home. Okay, I digress. So let's move on. So let's talk about the importance of having drive encryption. So what happens is if somebody steals this computer, they can literally take this C drive here, they can take it out of the computer, and they can plug it into their computer and they're going to slave it to their computer it's going to kind of look like this it may show up as local disk d for example and they're going to try to access it however if it's encrypted they won't be able to access it at all it would just say well you need the key to unlock this drive so there's a great security feature that comes with any type of drive encryption but this is um, also made easy with a bit locker so if they have access to your computer let's say they steal it and you know 
chances are that you have a password, right? Most of us have a password before they can log into their computer, so they can't get back past the password. So they take the drive out and they try to slave it inside of their computer. And if you don't have encryption, they can literally just go inside of C. They can go to your documents and look up anything that's inside and have full access to it. You can see there are some important stuff in here and then we don't want them to have any access to that, especially if you have passwords that are saved, for example, in a notepad. Let's say you have a notepad that you just keep around for a password. For example, let's say you see you have your Gmail password and then you have your login, chances are, you know, Gmail login, and then you may have it saved on a, in a notepad. And there's nothing wrong with that as long as you have drive encryption. So keep that in mind. If you are saving any passwords to your computer in a format as such, which is completely normal, you if you don't have drive encryption, then you're just kind of asking for uh, data loss or somebody, you know, God forbid, you know, this is just the worst type of, you know, scenarios that somebody steals your hard drive or they can even access it um, over um, in other ways, right? So that being said, we definitely want to have our drive encrypted. In our case, why not do it? Because it's free. It's completely free with Windows operating system. So let's look at the implementation of this in a business environment. But before I proceed, I would just like to ask you to take a few seconds to click like on this video or subscribe. In this case, I don't have to play an advertisement for you. Instead of waiting 30 seconds, you can just spend five seconds here and click like or subscribe. I really appreciate it, guys. I really do. Thank you so much. So let me show you how BitLocker is enabled. If you just have a personal computer, you can simply right click any of the drives and then you can select turn on BitLocker. So what happens is when you click turn on BitLocker, the computer itself will test the drive to see if it's compatible with BitLocker, and then it will tell you whether you can turn it on. Chances are that it will be because most drives are compatible with BitLocker encryption. So here we go. It gives you an option to save a recovery key. And again, I kind of touched on this a little bit earlier. A recovery key can be used to access your files and folders if you're having problems unlocking your PC. It's a good idea to have more than one and keep each in a safe place other than your PC. So this is incredibly important to save somewhere else that's not your PC. I personally, what I do is I either save it somewhere on like somewhere externally and you can, there are many options of doing this. For me personally, I have multiple copies of the bed locker and you know, you can, so here's an option. You can save it on an external USB if you really wanted to. You can save it on, uh, you can send it to your email. You can uh, just print it out if you really wanted to. Those are certainly options that you have here. And of course you have an option here that says save to your Microsoft account. I don't really do that because I may lose the password to my Microsoft account. You can save it to a file. That's definitely an option. You can print the recovery key as well. We will have a look here in a moment on how you would use the recovery key as well on an encrypted drive. However, let's touch on how this is used or implemented in a business environment. So the drive would be encrypted after the computer has been imaged or re-imaged. So after the, the system used in your business, it has finished installing the operating system anew, it would start to encrypt the drive with BitLocker. And at that point, whatever the system has initiated, I mean, this could be done possibly with a, you know, a, a batch script or some kind of a, a tool that initiates BitLocker and at the same time saves the file to a remote loco location. So it, that way you have access or a, a copy of that recovery key in case of a computer crash. So let's say user reports an issue where he says or he or she says, my computer crashed. And you look at it and you're like, oh, wow, this is a hardware hardware problem, let's say a motherboard died or something like that. And the problem is that you can't just take that drive and plug it into another computer. It won't work because BitLocker knows that that drive belongs to another PC. So you only, the only way to do, the only thing you can do here is slave the drive. And let me just cancel this or no, let me just move this out of the way. You can slave your drive and they would kind of show up like this, like a local disk D and then you would have an option. You would have a, like a lock key and I'll show you this and it would ask you for recovery key. So 
that's the thing. It would have a copy of this key somewhere else remote, and this process would encrypt it, save it somewhere else. So in case of a crash, of a hardware failure, you would have the system or a tool. It really depends on the business setup environment. It could be just a, a file spreadsheet somewhere. We don't know. But I digress. It would have that key, and then you would look it up probably by using the host name or maybe the serial number of that computer, you would look up what the key is for that so that way you can recover user data. So let's go ahead and do it manually here so to see what happens. I'm going to save it to a file and I'm going to click here, save, and you will see a specific error. And uh, for, for this here, I'm just gonna leave the bedlock recovery key as it is. So that way I don't need, I don't need to change it anything. It's self-explanatory, I already know what it is, but I wanna show you what happens if I was just to click save here. And you can see, right away that the BitLocker wizard here says, you can't save to this PC, please choose uh, another location. So let's go ahead and try desktop. We're gonna click save. Again, says this location can't be used. Your recovery can't be saved to an encrypted drive. Choose a different location. You see how everything kind of comes back to this to have a remote somewhere else recovery key located so that way you don't so that way you can recover the data, right? In case of a crash or anything like that. I mean, as far as I know, you may like, you may forget a password for your drive and then you can recover it with a recovery key. As long as you remember to keep a key somewhere safe that you know to look for it. Okay, so let's go ahead and save it to another drive. I'm gonna to try to see if I can save it to this other drive that is not encrypted. So I'm just going to leave it at D here uh, matter of fact, I'm going to create a new folder and I'm going to call it BitLocker Keys and I'm going to go inside of that and I'm going to save it as so. So let's go back in here and make sure that we do have that BitLocker key. Where's our thing? BitLocker Keys and here's our file. If we look inside of it, here are our keys. Here's the recovery key. Here's the identifier for it. And that's you can see that that's reflected in the file name as well. And uh, here is our recovery key in case of a crash. So you can see that the recovery key in this case is just a combination of different uh, of uh, numbers uh, with dashes. And this is 256-bit encryption for your drive. Okay, now that we have the key saved, I can go ahead and, and click next. It gives you an option on how to encrypt it. You can see the encrypt disk usage, encrypt used disk space only, and it's faster. And that's set up for base, brand new computers. So if it's a brand new install, this is what typically what happens. And anything else that's added to it, you save new files, programs, this and that, it's going to encrypt it automatically as it states here. And But if you have a computer that's been used for a long time, you might want to encrypt the entire drive, which is slower, but this is what happens. So, you know, chances are, if you remember that, you know, once your computer is reimaged, just, you know, use uh, the fast one and that should be fine because everything else you add to it later on will be uh, encrypted as well. So it's going to click next, new encryption mode. Here's a choose a, which encryption mode to use. As you can see here, there's a two different types of mode. Uh, the newest version is installed or introduced in version 15.11 of Windows 10. And if you aren't sure, you can just leave it at compatible mode so that way it's backwards compatible for all other versions of Windows that you may be running. If you're not worried about it, you can just leave it in new encryption mode because I believe the newest version of operating system, I believe it's 19 something. So we're well past that. Either way, it's fine. Uh, I'm just going to leave it in compatibility mode just in case. And then I'm going to, it's going to ask you, are you ready to encrypt this drive? Encryption may take a while depending on the size of your drive. He says you can keep working, which is fine, although your PC might run more slowly. So it's asking you if you want to do a, a bit locker system check. In this case, all it is doing is just making sure that the hard drive itself is in good running condition, meaning that there are no errors with the drive itself. And you can certainly do that just to be sure. So let's go ahead and do that. And then again, don't forget, I will show you how it looks like uh, when we are trying to recover data on a, an, an encrypted BitLocker drive. So what you're looking at here is what happens if somebody tries to boot from the BitLocker hard drive. 
this is the error they get. And you can see it's referring to a recovery key ID. And if you remember, it's the exact same one that we have for our hard drive. So I literally put it in another computer, try to boot it from that drive as well. And then now it's saying, well, you need the key to even, even attempt to even get to the login screen of this PC. And here's our reference number. We can compare it exactly to our key. And it's this here and then we have the identifier for it. So now it's asking for this specifically. All right, now let's see what happens when we log in to our computer and see it as a slaved drive. So here we are, our encrypted drive is now slaved. Now we can see that it has a little lock key on it. So let's double check it and see what happens. And here we go again. It's asking for that bit locker recovery key. All right, let's give it a shot and see what happens with that. I'm going to open up our recovery file. Here is our key. I'm going to copy this entire key like so. I'm going to try it again. I'm going to paste that in there. I'm going to hit unlock. And there you have it guys now you can see the little lock is unlocked and now we can go inside of this make any changes and recover user data which is typically located in users and under their login profile and lastly going back to our computer where we have encrypted it in originally we're going to have a look of some options that are there available for managing a bit locker. If we right click the C drive and select manage bit locker, we can see that we can once more back up your recovery key if you need a copy of it, or you can also turn off bit locker if you choose so. In today's video, we're learning some of the basics of PowerShell, specifically on how to install or execute application installation. So what, we'll, uh, what I will teach you here is how to use some basic commands that would lead you towards creating your own scripts that would allow you to install software through the PowerShell. So basically, once you go to the internet and you download something, it's going to be inside of downloads folder and whatever you decide to install, let's for example, take this example here, Media Creation Tool 1809, you would simply double click it and you get the prompt and you go through the prompts and then you install everything like that. Well, you can also execute this through the PowerShell. So there are a couple of ways of doing this which will help you get to the point where you create your own script to run PowerShell remote installs or even local installs, if you will, and that is to get to the same directory. So if we type in CD downloads, it's going to take us to that directory. The reason it got us to that directory is because we were already partially there. But if we really wanted to navigate to this, it would be simple as this. We're going to type in users, name of the local profile that I'm using, which is YT login, and then I'm going to type in downloads it's going to get us to the same place so if we type in dir we can see that that media creation tool is indeed there as well so this is one of those things you might want to double check every time you create or before you start to create your scripts <clears throat> by the way this is going to be a little bit more advanced so it's a little bit more advanced for uh, you know people who are more familiar with computer software, but if you're new to computers, I will try to go as slow as possible. Comparatively speaking, here's the same directory in a GUI form. So this is inside of our windows and we can see that it's exact same stuff that we see in here. So let's go ahead and execute it from the PowerShell. And the way to do that is to type in start process and then type in media creation tool dot exe. See, now we get the same prompt to uh, go through our uh, prompts to, you know, basically install our software. However, if you want to make this to be a silent operation, you would do the same thing and then just do a switch or a command, which is forward slash S. This would execute it silently if it is an MSI package, typically. It won't work here because this is executable. It's designed to literally go through the prompts like that. But if you do have MSI package, it will allow you to do so like so. And for example of an MSI package, in case you don't know, is for example, this one. This is an MSI installer for that, and that is .msi. Now here's another example of how to do it on from a remote uh, remote location. In our case, we might have something on a network level, which is for me located here. I went ahead and created a folder 
for this example on forward uh, backslash backslash kobuman one and that is the pc name or the server name that you might be using and then i'm going to type in folder name repo one so if we look inside of this one the ir we can see that we still have that media creation tool inside of that so the same way we can execute it from here as well so we can start type in the same way start process media creation tool 1809.exe since we're in the this directory already i can just hit enter and we're going to get that pop up again and it's installing so i went ahead and canceled it this is where you're getting all these errors now we can the same way we can start our script by typing in let's see here start dash process and then we're simply going to navigate to the network location let's see here and then it's going to be cobalman one for uh, folder name repo one and then we're going to do a backslash and then we're going to type in media creation tool 1809.exe. And we're going to hit enter. And now we have that pop up again. And again, if you want to make this silent, you're going to have to create your own MSI package or something like that and basically design it so it is silent. So meaning that nothing happens that you see visually, it just kind of installs it. So that's how you would do it. Uh, that's how you would start to create your script for a remote location using PowerShell. Now, you can also use a package manager to download different applications or access different applications and execute them like so, but you would have to have some kind of a uh, package manager that would allow you to do so. So let's look at a repository that's online available right now that you can kind of look at as an example of that. So there's one that was set up for testing by Microsoft, which we will navigate here in a moment. Let me just do a quick clear here so that we don't have any uh, confusion here. And in order to find these packages, we can type in find dash package. And then we need to specify a provider, which that means is you know dash provider this is basically indicates that we're going to now type in the provider name in our case the provider or our server name if you will is chocolatey i think that's how it's pronounced so we're going to hit enter here and see what happens so here's just the run of all the things that are available as in packages on this repository or uh, server if you will so how do we get any of these packages downloaded to our computer? We just kind of have to know which one we want, but we can also kind of, if we're specifically want to look for some specific, let's say, I don't know, uh, let's say notepad. So we can stop it from kind of going through all the things and see if there's anything available for notepad. Cause you can see there are so many different things here. And if there's something specific that you can, there you're looking for, you're going to have to, you know, kind of remember that or specifically search for. So let's stop this process here and I'm going to leave it up just for the sake of reference. I'm going to open up a new PowerShell and we're going to access the same repository, but I'm going to tell it to look for a specific name. And in our case, we're going to use an example of, namepad so we're going to type in again find dash package and then we're going to type in provider and then server chocolatey and i'm going to specify a command which is name that tells it i'm okay i want you to look for this specifically or anything or any derivative of that or anything like that i'm going to type in notepad and i'm going to use asterisk so i'm going to type in and everything that's uh, that has a notepad there's in inside of this uh, repository it's going to show up as so so now we can see all the things that are available as a package um, inside of this repository so yes we can now download these packages and uh, we're going we can use them in our package manager to push this type of different software so what can we do with this point well we can install one of these packages so let's go ahead and pick a, a random one let's Let's pick this one, Notepad++. We're going to do Control-C on this, so we have it saved. And then again, we're going to 
uh, we use some commands. And this is this case, instead of type in find package, we're going to type in install package. Install package, we're going to uh, type in provider once more, and then we're going to type in chocolatey, and then we're going to specify name, and then we're going to say notepad++. So let's see what happens when we execute that. And now it's asking us whether we trust this source, which is for the right reasons. If you're going to look at this repository, make sure that you feel comfortable with installing this on your computer. And here it asks you, are you sure you want to install software from Chocolady? And I can say yes, yes to all, no, or no to all, suspend, or, or if you're unsure, you can type in help. So in my case, I'm just gonna type in Y for yes, and I'm gonna hit enter. And now it's installing this package. So let's see what happened. Did this actually install it? This is actually what happened. When we did that, it actually just downloaded that repository into our folder that is created on the root of C, and it's going to be in our libraries. And here is our Chocolady. Uh, well, there's a core extension. There it is. Notepad++ is what we just got here. And there are a couple of different packages here that are installed. Ah, this one actually came with the installer. So that's cool. Now we can actually execute this installer if we really wanted to. And all right, I found that some of these uh, packages are not com incomplete that I've downloaded. For example, Visual Studio here, this one doesn't seem to have the actual the actual uh, executable in there. But this one actually installed. What is this one? This is part of the same one. Okay, well, we can execute this now. And all we got to do is just copy this path here. And then we can type in again, start process. And then we can specify that. And then we, we need to get the name of that installation. Let's do the uh, x64, the 64-bit version of that. And I'm going to paste that in there. And I'm going to hit Enter. And here it is. Now, let's see if it works silently. It errored out because I clicked No, as you saw. I'm going to use the S switch. Let's see if this... Nope. So, yeah, it has to be an MSI package for it to install silently. And this one is just a simple executable. Anyways, guys, I hope you find this kind of interesting because it really is. You can um, do, we can set up scripts that will allow you to install remote uh, software packages into multiple computers, this and that. There are many, many ways of going about this. This is kind of just an introduction to PowerShell. And uh, there are many, many different tools that you can look at. And, uh, and not only can you install, you can also uninstall. And again, there are different ways of doing this. You can use the invoke command or you can just use install package command. You can use the start process command, many, many different ways. And this is the great thing about PowerShell. You can customize this to your needs or to your business needs of just the way, you've, the way it feels the best for your type of business that you'll work at. And in today's video, I wanna talk about file association. This is a good to know for everybody, for everyday users like me and you, but also for people who do tech support. A lot of times you'll come across an application that requires specific software to run, but sometimes, and for some weird reason, it doesn't work because it doesn't know which application to use. This is usually, or this is typical with apps or applets that need to have a base software to run underneath uh, so that way it can do its thing. And that good example of that is Java applications or, or applets or even Java plugins. So, of course, we know what the basic file association is. If we look at this video file, we can see that it opens up using a Windows player. So if we right click it and go to properties, we can see that it opens with movies and TV, which is part of Windows, so it's a Windows uh, video player. But if you want to open this .mp4 file with something else, we can simply do this. Click Change, and for example, select the VLC Media Player. Click OK, 
selected and now it's using Windows Media Player. So that's a quick file association and you know this is pretty easy anybody can do this and it's really quick and really simple but sometimes in tech support in a business environment this breaks even if you have the correct software installed and uh, sometimes it may not prop run properly so let me show you an example that I've kind of recreated to show you what happens so here is a website this is a NASA website they have a bunch of Java uh, applets or you know simple Java applets that you can run and if we click save it's going to download it to our folder. So if we click open folder, we can now see that this extension that is JNLP, there's nothing associated. If I double click on it, it's just not going to know what to do because, you know, it doesn't, doesn't even have Java installed on this computer. However, sometimes even if you do have Java installed on your computer, this file association will break. In our case, there is no Java installed on this computer. Um, yeah, new web browsers like, for example, Chrome here and uh, probably Edge as well. And I'm assuming, um, I, you know, I'm not 100% not sure on IE, but um, Chrome, uh, I know, uses uh, Java plugins to run. So it wouldn't even need that. I went ahead and downloaded Java. So we're going to install Java here. And you can see that the file association will change immediately. But I will show you nonetheless on how to do it manually and properly in case this breaks and it becomes just a white sheet of paper as it is right now. So simple way to, to resolve this is to make sure you have Java installed. So we're going to install Java and uh, I'm not going to, okay, I'm just going to click Okay, and it's just going to install it real quick for you, and then this is going to change, hopefully, into the correct Java um, file association. It should, when it's done, it should know that it's downloading uh, or that it's installing. It should know that Java is installed. Uh, this is typically what happens whenever you install a program. It runs the file association at the end. It changes these settings right away, and it should work. But again, sometimes it breaks, and then you have to do it manually, and there is a different way of going about it instead of a quick way. So, all right, let's see what happens. I'm going to click close, and we can see that it, nothing happened. So uh, let me go ahead and refresh this to see nothing happened. So if I double-click it, huh, it actually knows, but it didn't tell us that. So what it does now, it's actually downloading this, uh, it downloaded that little applet from the NASA website, and this is exactly what happens whenever you need that file association. Or otherwise, you'll never get to this point where it's going to run that applet. So now, if we click Run, it's going to start our little application. Can't find the name of Intel ICD Open. <laughs> Okay, so it's not working for me because it doesn't have the OpenGL driver. Anyways, so here's what happens. It actually started using uh, OpenGL on uh, Java without OpenGL, and it's still, it's working, so that's good. Now we have this little globe, and now we have file association um, that is working. So let's go ahead and close this real quick, and go through Windows and tell it what it needs to use in order to run properly. So the way we're going to do this is going to right click on this little Windows icon. We're going to select apps and features up here. And then we're going to select default apps here. Very important. And then we're going to scroll down and we're going to select where it says choose default apps by file type. So this may take a little bit to pull up because it's literally pulling up all the file types in the entire system. So what you're going to see here uh, in a moment here is bunch of, on the left-hand side, dot extensions. So it's going to, for example, have all of these dot 3GP and everything else. So what we're looking for is an extension that is called, uh, let's see here, dot JNLP. I wanted to make sure you guys see that. So it's .jnlp. You can also see it right here. It says JNLP. So we're going to look for that. We're going to scroll down. JNLP. All right. JNLP. JNLP. Where is it? Where is it? There it is. So it already knows to use uh, Java Web Launcher. So to show you where that is, actually, in case it's not detected, um, Java Web Launcher. 
Uh, it's also known as Java Web Start. So if we go in the root of C and then we look for program files x86, Java, JRE, and then uh, bin, and then we're going to look for Java Web Start, which should be Java WS. I probably passed it. Java WS, Java WS. Java CPL, that's the Java control panel, which we will pull up as well because I wanted to show you the, there it is, Java WS. Because I wanted to show you the actual applet that downloaded to your computer. So Java WS, and that's the extension that it needs. So in this case, uh, let's see here, file association for that is correct. So it's Java uh, Web Launcher, which is also known as Java Web Start here. You see it says Web Start Launcher. That's the same thing. So since we are here, I'm going to open up a Java control panel, which by the way is also the same thing as if you were to go to control panel of the Windows. So if we just type in control panel and open it up, yeah, where is it? Java, there it is. Java 32-bit is the same thing as Java control panel, which is Java CPL. So here we are, and in this here, I'm going to show you what exactly downloaded to the Java applet. And this is always going to be on the first tab. You don't gotta you don't have to go anywhere else, but you do have to click here where it says temporary internet files, click view. And we can see now that it downloaded that Java applet right here, which is Whirlwind KML, and it's by NASA. And you can see that it type is application. So you will see this a lot when you do web, uh, web support. And again, if you're having issues with this, you can literally just delete it uh, right here, just be clicking the X. And uh, we're going to reinitiate it again because this applet, all it does here, it just calls for um, downloading off that from NASA website. See, it downloaded it again. And it's giving me the stupid error again, but that's not related to that. It's still going to run. Anyways, exit. Come on. Anyways, here it is working again. And that's how you do a file association in tech support and just on your computer, if that's what you're into. Uh, let's see. While I'm here in Java, I want to show you a couple other things to kind of look out for. Uh, the, one of the other typical things is security. Some websites will never get to that point where you get that applet to come up. So if you were to go to here and download it and this and that, uh, you, you may never come up to that point if you remember seeing that security pop-up or are you sure you want to run this type of thing. Uh, that sometimes you have to um, add that website as a trusted website, an exception list. And this is located in security. And this is typically done for uh, uh, web start applications. You can see here, web start applications. And if I click here, edit list, I can literally add the name of that website in there. And after that, it should start working. All right, let me just go to this website here real quick. And then we can copy this here. Cup, cup, <laughs> copy. And then we're going to put it in here. And now, the security prompts, if any, will not pop up and it will allow Java to run uh, automatically. Now let's double check again here, and this is another troubleshooting thing. Let's see where it's downloading from when I run this again. See, it's downloading actually from HTTPS worldwind.ca. So that's another way to troubleshoot this. So we can go in here and type in HTTPS worldwind. Dot CA. I think that's what it was, Whirlwind CA. So if you're having trouble running these type of applets, whirlwind.arc.nasa.gov. Okay, so um, I was wrong. It's the same thing, whirlwind.arc.nasa.gov. Okay, so yeah, because sometimes it does, you know, the applet itself may actually look uh, for a different location to download uh, the application itself um, locally, which... I have shown you that in Java control panel, and that was here under view, temporary internet files. All right, guys, I hope you find this useful. If you have any questions, feel free to ask them in the comments below. Please leave a like. I really appreciate that. It really helps the channel move forward. 
Um, it, it helps get more reviews, to be honest. And I really appreciate you guys watching and your support. I, uh, I'm utterly grateful. So <laughs> thank you so much. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Hello, my friends. My name is Erin, also known as Kobo Man. This video is about most common audio issues. So let's say you come across this video, but you have a specific issue that you don't know how to fix or figure out. Chances are I have a solution for you. You just have to watch the whole video. Here's the thing. I am an IT professional, and I will go through many, many different things here that could be causing a problem with your audio. And there are things that you don't even think about as someone that doesn't work with computers as much as I do. And I'm not trying to glorify myself. All I'm trying to say is if you watch the whole video, chances are one of these things that I show you will fix your problem. So let's say you can't hear from your headset. Let's say people can't hear you on your microphone. Chances are I'll have a solution for you here. All right. So let's get into it right away. So the first thing we have here is typically what you see on the right hand side is the little speaker icon that you select. Believe it or not, I've seen people's computer is muted like that and they say I can't I can't hear people well it's muted so obviously you would do that next thing we want to look at is the sound settings here so if you right click the little icon here and then select open sound settings this is where it would take you the first thing you see here is the output device you can see that it's right now selected to Realtek high definition audio what that means is that this is the most common audio system that's installed on your computer whether it's a laptop or a desktop this is the default this is whatever you plug into your computer and i'll show you a screenshot of that right now whatever's plugged into that it's going to go through this so in order for it to work obviously this has to be selected like so if you click on it anything else that's connected as an audio device will show up so let's say you have a usb headset then it would show up just like so. So if I select this, now I'm using USB headset. As simple as that. That means whatever you want to use, you would pick that. So let's say you just have regular headphones with its 3.5 millimeter little jack. You plug that in, make sure you plug it into the correct one. And you know, depending what it is, if you just have regular headphones, no microphone, make sure you connect it to the proper port, which is 3.5 millimeter as well. And then you gotta make sure that it's selected to this. Realtek because that's what you plugged in you literally plugged it into the computer that you're using right so but if you use your USB uh, you know headset then you have to make sure that it's that selected right and of course make sure the audio is adjusted accordingly okay now let me touch on Bluetooth real quick which is right here on the right hand side if you select Bluetooth and you can see that your Bluetooth audio device is there then chances are then that you have to move on to the other things that I will talk about here in a second. But if you're if you don't see your if you don't see your Bluetooth device here, make sure you click Add, select Bluetooth, and make sure it's paired with your headphones or headset or speakers or whatever it is that you have connected. So that's the first thing if you have a Bluetooth device. Otherwise, whatever I'm going to talk about next is not going to apply to you at all unless you already paired your Bluetooth headset. All right, let's move on to the next thing. I'm just gonna close this right quick so I can show you where the sound panel is. So if I go back here, right click, open sound settings, and the next thing we're going to look at is sound control panel, which is right underneath the Bluetooth and other devices. So I'm gonna select that, and I'm gonna close the window behind it real quick, so that way I have a better of a, better of a contrast um, going on here. So the first thing we see that is that we have two different devices here. Let's say you bought a new USB headset. You plug that in and then suddenly it's not working. Well, chances are this is what you're looking at here. This blue, or I'm sorry, this green circle with a white check mark inside of it means that it, this device is set as default. It means that this is selected right now to be used. Remember the first thing I told you and showed you in the drop down? This is the exact same thing, except this is a more advanced way of doing it, right? So if you want to use your USB audio device, which is this, make sure you select it and click set default, right? You se select that set as default. If you can't see your USB audio device, chances are it may be disabled. So if I, and I'll show you here, if I disable this, by default, show disabled devices is not there. So if it's disabled, chances are you may not even see it. So if you right click anywhere in this right area and, and, sh and click show disabled devices, you can see that it comes up right there. And all you gotta do is just select enable. 
So guys, this is this guys, this is one of those things where I was telling you chances are that I have a solution for you in this video. You just have to watch the whole thing because there's so many things that you can adjust that, that, that could be your problem, right? Anyways, so this is basically how you would make sure that you can hear from the you can hear inside of your headset. So your speakers, right? Your speakers have sound. And of course, you can double click any of these things and change the levels, but it's the same difference as if you were going to the, you know, if you collect the if you select a little you know speaker icon here and adjust it like that you just have to make sure that whatever it is that you're trying to do here whatever it is that you're trying to use here is set by default so let's move on to the next tab and this is going to be for the for you guys that have an issue with people uh, can't hear you on your microphone or you have low microphone um, output right meaning that people can't hear you as well here is what shows up as a microphone again show disable devices is like this right see this is our real tech front panel and the rear panel as well so if you have a computer right and it has these 3.5 millimeter jacks and again i'll show you a screenshot here so you can see it so you can understand that it's super easy these are right now unplugged and this is what that red pointing down arrow means it means that these are enabled but there's nothing plugged inside of them and you can see that it's separate from here so here is the microphone and if you had something connected to it it would turn it would just disappear it would not have that red arrow and it would be full on full contrast like this right now what we have is a microphone on the usb headset that is connected so we have to make sure that that's selected as default right since i have no other microphones connected right now this one is going to be set as default but if you have multiple ones you have to make sure that you select the correct one and then select set as default just like i showed you right on on the previous tab for the playback or for uh, the speakers right so if people can't hear you well through your microphone we have to look at the properties of the microphone itself so you can select properties down here or we can just double click it and then it opens up our microphone properties panel the first thing that we can select here as the next tab over is listen. If we select the listen and apply, what happens is we are testing to see if we can hear ourselves through the microphone. This is actually a really good way to see how or to hear how well other people can hear us through that microphone. So once you do this test, make sure you uncheck it and click apply. Otherwise, you're going to hear yourself, your own echo all the time. But this is a really good way to check to see the levels of your microphone um, i would suggest actually you turn this on and so you can go to the next step and troubleshoot the volume of the microphone easy so the next thing we click over in this tab what you would typically see is a microphone boost check mark so this is on regular standard headsets it would say literally microphone boost instead of agc agc here means that it automatically adjusts the levels of the microphone depending it just does it automatically so you don't have to worry about that but if you need to enable microphone boost this is where it'll be under custom the next tab over is the levels so if somebody can't hear you well or your recording is not that good on the microphone this is how you would adjust the volume for the microphone as simple as that make sure this is enabled but sometimes you would have this 100 percent but you still can't hear well that's when you go back to custom, make sure this is enabled, or again, I would, it would say microphone boost, right? The only problem with microphone boost is the chances are that it may pick up noise, meaning like audio noise, background noise, static, and this and that. So I highly um, suggest that you test that beforehand. So that way, you know, you have really good, clean audio going. And again, you can do that through the listen here, or you can record yourself, for example, using Audacity, or you know something like that. Uh, Windows has a built-in sound recording uh, little app that you can try as well. So what if your problem is that you don't have, you don't see any of your you know devices connected whatsoever? There's nothing that comes up. Well, chances are you need to install the device driver for it. Where do we find that? Well, we have to go to the device manager to find that. So if you just go to search but search box here and just type in device manager. It will show up like so or alternatively you can right click the windows icon here and select device manager in here 
if you have your device audio device connected it would be under the first tab here and if you click a little you know if you expand it you can see what shows up there if it's disabled here or there's a little exclamation mark chances are you may need to update or install the driver for your specific headset or speakers or you know sound card that you may have installed for your computer this is pretty rare nowadays this used to be more common with previous version of windows but if that's your issue make sure that you know the, it, just kind of check here and if there's an exclamation mark or it's disabled in here make sure you get the proper driver from the manufacturer of your headset or your sound card all right guys these are some of the most common audio issues that you may encounter if you like this video please share it with friends so leave a like if you have any comments i will be more than glad to answer them i i enjoy helping people so this is one of my things that i do so all right so thank you so much for watching and i wish you a wonderful day bye bye Hello my friends, my name is Irvin, also known as Kobuman. In today's video, we're talking about top five reasons why your computer might be running slow. Number one, background processes. Number two, low RAM. Number three, computer updates. Number four, virus or malware attack. Number five, computer overheating. And as a bonus, I will talk about why a video game might be running slow. All right, let's look at number one reason, and that is background processes. So what is a background process? Well, it's self-explanatory. It's a process that runs in the background or a program if you will to make it a little bit easier to understand so you can find these in your task manager if you right click your toolbar in windows select task manager you can see that there are a bunch of background processes running that's because that's the first very first tab here you can see there are a bunch of things running in the background and some are idle with taking up some of the memory or ram i should say and then there are some that are constantly running in the background like so if you see that it's running like this this is pretty normal you know i'd say around five percent of cpu usage max on idle is probably okay for most computers however if you see this go up you know really high that means that a process in the background is taking up your cpu power and every time you try to launch a new application or even just use the computer your computer is going to run really slow let me show you an example of that by the way if you open this up in windows 10 for the first time this is how it's going to look like in order to see everything you just have to click on more details but i digress let's look at an example of a background process that could cause a lot of cpu usage so I'm, i have a immunet open which is antivirus software so i'm just going to click full scan the reason i'm using this as a demonstration is because a lot of antivirus softwares including this one like to run background scans like this for viruses automatically so they have a set schedule and it would show up kind of like this now it's using up 34 percent of your cpu power and of course they can this can spike up quite a bit even up to 99 percent or even 100 percent of cpu usage now this is you know normal for immune net to do as long as you're aware so you don't necessarily want to kill this um, service which would obviously speed up your computer so if you just go over here and then stop it right if you end task it's going to stop it and then of course you can speed up your computer like that but in this case you might want to you know stop and, and uh, well you might want to actually stop and wait for it to finish right so if i stop scan and then i just close you can see that it canceled that and now it's going to go back down to normal speeds of the immune net it takes a few seconds here and that's what happens sometimes you would see memory usage be super super high that could be another reason uh, of a, another uh, example of a background process taking up too much power and now you can see that immune is going down slowly here which is really normal so if you can't prevent a background service to run uh, that's probably related because it's scheduled or it's set up to start at a startup so you re you reboot your computer or even log out of your computer log back in it's going to start up and that is located in the a startup menu which is the fourth over in the task manager you can see them here uh, they're conveniently uh, positioned here so you can literally look at what they are and you can see which one of those actually start automatically here is the immune net 
this is the antivirus it starts automatically i want that and i'm perfectly okay with that if i want to disable it i can disable it down here on the bottom simply click disable since i don't want to do that with the antivirus i'm just going to as an example i'm going to disable this audio manager and you can see now that it's disabled now keep in mind there's one more place that a computer or i should say that a program can run on startup and have a background process running like that and one of those is in this location this is program data microsoft uh, windows start menu program startup what this is this is a path for a shortcut to be placed by a program which initiates the startup of that program that has that shortcut so like for example if i have microsoft edge in here it's going to start up microsoft edge every time i reboot the computer which could be run as a service as as a service running that's in the background process i should say so if i reboot the computer microsoft edge will show up here and it's going to show in here as running so if you have anything else in here that you find that you don't want to run on startup this is where you would find it and this is where you would remove it so by default program data is invisible so if you go to c you can see the program data is not there because it's a hidden folder you can simply enable you know show hidden icons or whatever or like this hidden items and you can see the program data showed up there and then you go to program data and i showed you that you know it's microsoft let's see here windows start menu programs startup okay now we don't want microsoft edge to start up we're going to delete it and that's that all right let's move on to the next one all right so number two reason is not enough ram so let's go back to our task manager and look to see how much ram we have i purposely set this up so you guys can see if i go to performance tab this is one way to see how much ram you have you can see that i only have four gigabytes of ram and half of that is being used, which is 54%, which is 54%. So let's say you have a program that demands a lot more, or you want to run more than one program, chances are that four gigabytes is not going to be enough. So I'm already using 2.1 gigabytes out of four, and that's used for catching, you know, page file, this and that. And of course you want to allow this because, you know, your computer is going to run more efficiently. Um, with with not having enough RAM, if I run more applications than this, let's say, you know, video editor, uh, you know, a video game, uh, some kind of virtual machine or whatever else, this is going to be a problem because I'm going to run out of RAM. So what that means is that once you run out of RAM, it's going to switch to using the local disk page file, which is also known as virtual memory. Let's have a look at that to, so I can explain to you properly what that means. If you go to advanced system settings and look at the very first performance tab if we open it up and select advanced again you can see what the page file is set to this paging file size for all drives is 1.4 gigabytes and it's also known as virtual memory as you can see here but it's also it has a really good description here it says a paging file is an area on the hard disk that windows uses as if it were ram keep in mind it switches to using your local disk as ram local disk is a lot slower i mean a lot slower than your ram and that's the whole point of having ram is to use it as a temporary storage for the applications that are running in the background because it's a lot faster than your local c drive so if you run out of ram your computer would crash if you didn't have virtual memory set up. So it switches over to using the virtual memory that's on the C and it slows down. Okay, let's have a look at the other example. So number three is computer updates. Computer updates is something that can slow down the computer. You can also see that the computer updates are happening in your task manager as well as a process but one way to make sure uh you know or to double check that you do have updates is to sim simply go to check for updates tab and you can see whether if there whether it's something happening here right now i am up to date but if you go to windows update you can see that there's something running here 
and that could greatly slow down your computer. So the best thing to do is just wait for it to finish and then reboot. Another big problem with Windows Update is that it takes forever to reboot the computer at times. And biggest, uh, the best solution for that is to upgrade your computer to a faster local drive. Or I should say, if you have a magnetic old drive, it's best to upgrade it to solid state drive. This is why you see people upgrading to solid state drives because they are a lot faster compared to old magnetic type of drives. And this will save you a lot of times, especially uh, when it comes to updates or anything else that you do within the computer and inherently will speed up every component of your computer. So I highly suggest to upgrade to solid state drive if you haven't done so already. Again, if you want to look at the examples of my gear that I use, uh, there's a link in the description box. All right, let's move on to the other example. So number four example is virus or malware attack. When you have a virus, it's most likely going to act just like a process running in the background that is taking up a lot of CPU power, especially if it's a zombie type of virus, but it basically takes up, it takes over your computer and it uses its resources to do malicious stuff. And that could be presented here in CPU and memory usage. So you can clearly see that. Obviously, solution for that is to run your antivirus, you know, make sure that everything is safe and good. But if you do have a virus or a bad malware, it will be running back here and it would look very weird. You could kind of recognize it. If you familiarize yourself with the processes that are normally running on your computer, you can see uh, a virus clearly will be named something weird or something off. For example, it would say system two, for example, to hide itself from a plain site. You know what I mean? But in general, it would be using a lot of CPU usage. Sure, there are viruses that sit in the background and quietly do their stuff, which you may not notice. But if your computer is running slow, chances are that it's it, if it is caused by the virus that it's using up the CPU or RAM power and uh, or RAM resources, and that would be causing a lot of slowdown issues for your computer. And again, you would just use antivirus to get rid of that. Or if you have to, um, you would reimage the computer, basically reinstall the operating system if you cannot get rid of the virus itself. Okay, moving on to the next one. So number five reason is computer overheating. Why is this happening? Well, this can happen if your computer is dirty. So it might be a physical issue that requires your attention when it comes to cleaning your computer and your CPU is suffering because of that. And I'll tell you why. So let's say you're experiencing slowdowns and then you can't tell why. Chances are that it's caused by CPU overheating due to the dust collected in your computer or simply, you know, CPU not installed properly. Here's an example of that. Here's the CPU that's on this computer. You can see that it's Intel 6500 CPU and it runs at 3.2 gigahertz. However, you can see that it's set at 3.19 right now. And that's a perfect example to show you that your computer can automatically adjust the speed of your CPU based on the conditions. So yes, this CPU can probably run at higher speeds. Uh, probably, I think the turbo for this one is around four gigahertz and your computer will bring it up to the four gigahertz speeds as well. If the conditions are right, means that the temperatures are right. CPUs are super sensitive to temperature. At the same time, if your computer is overheating, it's going to automatically bring down the speed and it's even possible that it would go even lower than the standard speed or a stock speed, I should say, of 